Hi, uh, I'm Pedro Domingos. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Washington and machine learning researcher, probably best known as the author of The Master Algorithm, Popular Science Introduction to uh, Machine Learning. I'm here at NeurIPS 2022. Uh, of the vast amounts of stuff that's happening here, the two that I found most interesting and are closest to my own research are neurosymbolic AI and symmetry-based learning. Okay, Professor Pedro Domingos, it's an absolute honor to have you back on the show. Uh, Pedro is a professor at the University of Washington and um, give us a quick introduction to yourself, to your experience here at Europe so far and what's top of mind for you. I'm a machine learning researcher. I've worked in most of the major areas. Uh, I've also uh, written a popular science book on machine learning called The Master Algorithm. Uh, I'm having a lot of fun here at NIPS, uh, listening to various talks like David Charmel's on consciousness and, and uh, Jeff Hinton on sleep. And, uh, you know, looking forward to the rest of it. Awesome. I'd love to get your thoughts on Chalmers um, in, in a bit, actually. But um, the first thing I wanted to talk about, just because it's top of mind, is this whole Galactica situation. <laughs> so um, first of all, I, I was speaking with Ian the other day, and I think it's a little bit unfair that Meta really bear the brunt of this. Uh, OpenAI have just released this new chat GPT um, bot, which you know suffers from similar failure modes, and it just kind of feels that they're not getting anywhere near as much stick as Meta is. Well, I think uh, I agree with you. I think the brouhaha about Galactica is way overblown. That system is really largely harmless. It's just another large language model that's designed for actually something that to me as a scientist is very interesting, right? I would love to have a system like that uh, to help me out with certain things. And I think it's a step in the right direction. And, and I think the brouhaha over it is an instance of people jumping the gun on a lot of these AI things in a way that to me is very excessive. Having said that, in a way they set themselves up for it in a way that they needn't have. They kind of overclaimed what it did. And you know, like the problem with this with these LLMs is that they generate a lot of stuff that looks good but can be completely wrong. Mm. And in a way, there's no worse place to do that than in writing scientific articles. So when they came out with it, they should have been more careful about the, how they framed it. I think yeah. the two concerns sort of like this competition and one upping each other on who come up with comes up with the you know with the frilliest demo and, and that kind of backfired. So they shouldn't have had to, you know, um, withdraw it. I think it's that, that that's all pathetic, and hopefully they've, they've, you know, they've learned the lesson that next time they will do it slightly differently. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, um, so Gary Marcus has been very loud about this on on Twitter. So he he's he's really pushing the point about misinformation. And the thing is, as well, I don't want to um, characterize the ethics folks as having monolithic views because they don't have monolithic views. And I also think that a lot of the um, the ethics guidelines for large language models are very reasonable. Like I, I interviewed the CEO of Cohere the other week, Aidan Gomez. I went through their terms and conditions and policies, all very reasonable. The only sticking point for me is the misinformation one. I, I think the the kind of the moral valence of it is in its use, right? And And especially with misrepresentation. I don't like this paternalism telling me what's good for me. I've just lost out on using a really cool tool, basically. I mean, I completely agree with you. I would take it even further. I do not want other people deciding for me what is misinformation and what is therefore allowed to be said because it's misinformation or not. For a couple of reasons. One is that these people who claim to be big critics of misinformation, a lot of them are misinformers themselves. And the bottom line is that you always have your ideology that, you know, um, informs what you think is true and false. And I don't want anybody, every one of us in a democracy should be deciding for themselves what is true and what is false and what is valid and what isn't. And I, I have no fear of attempts to misinform me as long as I have a multiplicity of sources, right? The biggest misinformation danger is, what, is when you have only one monolithic source of truth, whatever it is, which mm -hmm. is unfortunately what a lot of these anti-misinformation people uh, I think consciously or unconsciously want. Give me, you know, 10 things, nine of which are misinformation. I can do the job of figuring out which one I think is valid. Give me only one of those things and chances are nine in 10 that it is misinformation and then I have no chance to overcome it. So this whole attack on things because they're misinformation. And I mean, I understand the impulse. Hmm. They're like, why have all this falsehood flying around? But the way to overcome that falsehood is not by censoring it. 
We yeah. should know this, right? We, we shouldn't be having to refight all of this over again in the context of social media and, you know, and, and, and large language models and so on. So you said something really interesting, which is that this notion of, of a pure truth or a monolithic truth. And there's this concept of, um, you know, epistemic um, subjectivity, right? Or, you know, things observe a relative, even um, complex um, phenomena like intelligence. No one understands what it is. You can't reduce it to one particular thing. People have different views on it, right? So this notion that, that there is a pure monolithic truth of, of the world, I, I think, is, is horrifying. Well, I would, I would put it slightly differently. Um, so first of all, there's a the question, is there one reality or not? Right? Is there truth or is there my truth and your truth? Right? I actually, I understand the impulse to talk about my truth and your truth, but I think as a, so what is really true, we don't know, but as a, I think the most useful, including socially useful working hypothesis is that there is a single reality and a single truth, but it's extremely complex so not, none of, no single one of us can get at it. So what we need is many different people coming at it from different angles, but with the premise that we need to try to make these things consistent. Mm. So just saying, oh, we have different truths and there's no reality, that is actually very counterproductive because it, it uh, gives everybody a pass to just believe whatever wacky thing they want. And then the consequences of that when you have to make the real decisions are very bad. At the same time, I agree with you, if you, if, 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 if I think that I have access to that truth and everybody just needs to, you know, kowtow to it, that is very dangerous. So I think we need to entertain these two ideas that there is a truth, but it's very complex and no one has a monopoly on it. And the key is, you know, like objective truth is what different observers can agree on. Mm. And now we can figure out what it is that we agree on. And that way we make progress in understanding reality. And we also tend to make more of the right decisions because we're closer to the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. But do you do you see it as I mean I think the reality thing is 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 interesting but do you just see it cynically as gatekeeping, as in having a clerical class controlling? Oh, absolutely! No, absolutely! Yeah. I mean, and if that that's precisely the danger that I was referring to yeah. is that uh, if you let me put it this way, if ever there is and this is a, a commonly mooted proposal, right, and not even proposal like, oh, we're going to have a truth commission yeah. of people who decide what is true on whatever Twitter or something, right? That is, that, that is a really alarming thing because there is no commission that can do that. What they're going to do is they're going to impose their version of reality on everybody else, which unfortunately is what a lot of these people want to do. Hmm. They convince hmm. that they have the truth and they want to impose it on the rest of us, and that is really alarming. We know historically what happens when people succeed in doing that. Yes, yes, but I suppose my, my point with the gatekeeping is it, it almost gets you to the actual truth of the matter is irrelevant. It, it's actually about power. But what's your take on, uh, I don't know whether you think this is putting it too strongly, but this being a, a form of industrial um, kind of gaslighting, kind of, kind of, you know, in an Orwellian sense, trying to shape people's reality through, you know, language, culture and, and, and interactions on the Internet? I think a lot of it is deliberate. Uh, some of it is, I mean, I'm an optimist about human nature at the end of the day, uh, maybe, in, you know, maybe with justification, maybe without. I think... So there's this postmodern view that it's all about power, hmm. and it's certainly partly about power, but I think a lot of the people doing this, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, they are, they're not seeking power for its own sake. They, they have a set of beliefs that they think is right, hmm. and then the means, you know, the end justify the means, right? That's the problem. So that, that gatekeeping, you know, and that gaslighting happen not because, not for their own sake, they happen for the sake of a cause. Mm -hmm. And now there's two problems with this is that these days the causes are for, on behalf of which this is being done, in my view, are largely wrong, right? But whether they're right or wrong, right? The problem is that this is just noxious in its own right. And also then a lot of sort of like, again, personal desire for power and promotion and prevailing over others, then of course, you know, hitches a right onto this. Yeah, interesting. I mean, we'll get we'll get into consequentialism um, in, in a minute, because I think there's quite an interesting uh, journey we can go there. But I wanted to cite Francois Cholet. Uh, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of him. He just tweeted saying, I'm not too concerned with whether what I read is right or wrong. I can figure that part out myself. I'm interested in things that are useful, thought provoking, novel. Sometimes the most creative thinkers have a bias towards wrongness, but they're still worth reading. Would you agree with that? Yes, I largely agree with that. So as, as I was saying before, uh, you know, I can 
tell for myself where I can do that exercise of figuring out what is right and wrong. The most important thing that I want is to not miss out on things that I don't want to miss out on. Like, you know, the known unknowns and mm -hmm. the unknown unknowns. Mm -hmm. The biggest killer is the unknown unknown. So the, if any, anybody trying to learn or understand something, they're for person or organization or society, right? If all they do is, is move the unknown unknowns to mm -hmm. known unknowns, they've already gone an enormous distance, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I appreciate people who I disagree with, first of all, because that's how you sharpen ideas. Yeah. But also because... They, they, they might just bring things to my attention that if we were all conforming to the more majority view w would not come to our attention. And then those more often than not are the ones that kill you. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, there's a real analogy here, even uh, this might be tenuous, but between symbolism and, and, and connectionism or, you know, Rich Sutton said we shouldn't be handcrafting our, our AI systems. We should kind of let them emerge. And it's a similar thing with our moral framework, but you're kind of saying that it should be emergent from low level complexity and diversity and, and interestingness. And, and there is another school of thought, which is that we should be top down and, and we already have a representation. I actually think it should be, it needs to be a combination. Yeah. We need to have both. This is one of those debates that in some sense puzzles me because to me, the obvious answer is that we need both. Hmm. And, they, and then, and if you read the master algorithm, this is what I do. I look at the different paradigms of machine learning and I don't come out in favor of any of them because I actually think we need ideas from all of them and then we need to combine them into something coherent. And like, if you look at psychology, like your brain does bottom up and top down processing. And if it only did one of them, either one, it wouldn't work. And I think as we try to build a larger intelligence, it's the same thing. We definitely need the bottom up part. And you know, by volume, the, bo the bottom up part is gonna be bigger. So if you could only have one, that would probably be you know, the choice. But the, but the, but the top-down part is also very important. If you go all the way back, the top-down part probably started as bottom-up and got synthesized and improved, but now we need that loop. The loop is actually very important. Well, that's interesting. So in, in, in your book, I guess I want to sketch out different types of AI architecture. So, you know, you get universalists, this kind of deep mind idea that a very simple underlying algorithm could produce everything. Right. And then you get, um, you know, hybrid folks on the other side of the spectrum. And, and then there's an integrated approach in, in the middle. Like, where would you kind of place yourself on that continuum? I would place myself very much in the uh, frame of mind. Uh, well, let me put it this way. I don't know, but which is nobody does, right? Mm. If somebody tells you that they know how we're going to get to intelligence, you should be suspicious right away. But what do I think is the most promising approach and the one that ideally would be the best one if we can pull it off? It's there being a single algorithm. Yeah. So at that level, I very much sympathize with, with what is effectively DeepMind's agenda. Now, where I part with a lot of these people is that I don't think that the, 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 the algorithm that we need is as simple as many of those people think it is. Mm. And I don't think it exists. Mm. It probably, it is probably the case that the algorithm that we really need at the end of the day doesn't even look that much that like any of the things that we have now. So I think hopefully there is such an algorithm, but we're still far from it. Interesting. I mean, they, they would cite um, the example of evolution as being a very simple underlying algorithm, although Ken Stanley would say that um, people misunderstand evolution. So I agree with him at that level. In fact, in the master algorithm, I have a chapter where I go over, you know, the objections and the reasons to believe that there is a master algorithm. Mm -hmm. A lot of, the majority of the people, even in the field, are skeptical of that notion, even though I would claim that effectively that's what they're pursuing. People like Rich Sutton and Jeff Hitton, I asked a bunch of people before I wrote the book, and they do believe in this idea of having a master algorithm. Hmm. A lot of people believe that, but intuitively, a lot of people believe that, no, it doesn't, there is no such thing, right? And I, I understand that intuition, but I think it's, well, I, I don't I think, think it's a well-founded intuition, let me put it that way. But in, in a sense, we know there is such a thing. We look at cellular automata, look at what we've already done with, with deep learning. I, I, I think the context is, is there such a thing that will produce what we want? Well, yeah. So, yeah. To take your, you know, your your example, or or, you know, DeepMind's example of evolution, right? Yeah. I do. So, so, in 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 the book, I mentioned empirical evidence that there is a mass algorithm, mm. and Exhibit One is evolution, mm. right? Mm. If you think of evolution as an algorithm, which, by the way, is a very old idea. I think it was George Boole that said, you know, God does not create animals and plants; he creates the uh, the algorithm by which animals and plants come about. He didn't use the word algorithm, but that that's essentially what he said. This, I think, is right on, right? And then, but another example is your brain. If the algorithm doesn't have to be something as simple as, as, as backprop and you're a materialist like most of the scientists are, yeah. your brain, if, if the master algorithm is an algorithm that can learn anything you do, then 
Your brain is that algorithm, right? But then there's another one which is even more fundamental, right? Mm -hmm. we, but I think from the point of view of this debate is very illuminating, which is the laws of physics. Why stop at evolution, right? The laws of physics are the master algorithm, right? Evolution is very complicated. In fact, what I think about, you know, evolution in AI currently is that evolution in reality is much more complex than we give it credit for, yeah. which is why a lot of our current genetic algorithms don't work that well. Mm -hmm. But the laws of physics mm -hmm. at this level are much simpler. And if you think about it, from the laws of physics comes evolution and comes all the intelligence that we have. It's very intriguing why that happens and why the laws are such that that happens, but even just the laws of physics are already a master algorithm. Now what you, what you could say, and many people immediately say is like, oh, but if you start from there, you know, you'll never get anywhere, right? Hmm. But then you can say like, evolution is the laws of physics sped up in a certain direction, mm -hmm. and then our reinforcement learning is like evolution. People have pointed out the similarity, except it's faster, and in a way, what we're trying to do now in machine learning is the same thing yet again, except only even faster. But what are the consequences of, I mean, let's say um, it is actually a very high resolution algorithm. So it's something that appears to be completely unintelligible to, in respect of the output phenomena. Is that, is that even a good place to be? Because, you know, just like with cellular automata, there's no real paradigmatic relationship between the underlying rules and the emergent phenomena, right? So is that really even something we want? No, I think there is, so we don't know, but I think people, and this is very common among connections to say, this stuff is also complex that we can't possibly have a handle on it. We just have to let it happen. And I think that is not giving enough credit to, to our human brains, right? Mm. We are incredibly good at making sense of things that in the beginning don't, I mean, over and over and over in the history of science and technology, you start out with things that you don't understand very well at all. But then over time, we kind of change our representation of the world to make those things actually be intelligible to us. Mm. And, and we should not a priori assume that that's not going to be the case here. So, for example, cellular automata, amazing things come out of whatever, the game of life that seem completely disconnected from the rules, but they aren't, mm. right? And, you know, there's, you know there's, there's various depths at which you, to go, you could go into this. There will probably, at the end of the day, be some large element of this that we can't figure out very well, but we can figure out enough that we have a handle on it. So this singularity notion that at some point AI is just completely beyond our understanding, I tend not to buy. It, it, I don't think it will be completely beyond our understanding. But it, it, it's a, an analog back to our Twitter discussion, though, because we can only understand it through, it's like having views on a mountain range, you know, the view looks different depending on where you're standing. And it's the same thing with, with the, the emergent phenomena in a cellular automata. No, very good. And, you know, the, the classic example of this is the, is the blind man and the elephant, that's right? right? Yeah. And, and that's, that's actually the metaphor that I use in the book is I say, you know, the different tribes are like different blind men, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but, it, but precisely so, I as one of the blind men, I can see part of the elephant, but it behooves me to also talk to you who see another part of the elephant. And then each of us understands a little bit more of the elephant than we would if we were on our own. But yeah. most importantly, we collectively, which is what really matters, actually understand maybe not the elephant completely, but much more of the elephant than either was, either any of us would alone, right? And, and it's certainly a lot better than just giving up and say like, oh, we're never going to understand this strange thing that's in front of us. Interesting. But that's a great argument to what you were saying before. So um, it's beyond our cognitive horizon. Therefore, we need to have diversity of aspect. There's a, yes, there's a question of it's whether it's beyond the cognitive ability of a single human. Yeah. And then there's the question of whether it's beyond the cognitive ability of an entire society of humans. And obviously there'll be things that are beyond the, the cognitive ability of a single human, but not beyond the cognitive ability of a society. Also, these days we have computers. Yeah. So our cognitive power is augmented by our machines. So we can understand things or bring things to the point where we understand them to a degree today that we couldn't a hundred years ago. Right. Now that is a fascinating point. So um, it's beyond our cognitive horizon individually, but it might not be beyond the cognitive horizon of loads and loads of humans on the internet, you know, the wisdom of crowds, but we don't, I mean, how do we know that the crowd understands? Well, we know, well, well, that's the, the, in some sense, the beauty of this, right, is that we never, what is the crowd really understanding, right? And again, once the crowd is augmented by machines, like machine learning algorithms, right, we can ask, what do we as a society Equipped with all of our, you know, large language models and so on and so forth, what do we really understand right now? Mm. At some level, you can't answer that question individually because you are just an individual. But right, there's a couple of very important things that that we shouldn't forget. One is that you could one thing you can do, and that that I do do, say like 
do I now actually, even just individually understand things better than I did before when it was just me looking at it? And the answer to that is almost invariably yes, right? So, so there is a big gain to be had there. And the second one is that you ultimately you tell by the consequences, right? And it, like, for example, take a deep network, right? And you may not know how it works, but if it's doing medical diagnosis, you can tell whether it, you know, gets the diagnosis right more often than, than it did before or more often than another model. So we as a society may not, you know, we individuals may not very understand very well what we as a society understand, but we can see the consequences. And at some level, that's the point. Yeah, so on that, I mean, that sounds like a bit of an appeal to behaviorism. And I, I, I'm, we're going to talk about that in respect of Chalmers as well. But um, it also brings us back to, you know, we were talking about empiricism versus rationalism and, and nativism and, and all of these topics. Um, would you place yourself in, in that camp of, of being a, a nativist and a rationalist or, or completely the other way? No, absolutely not. Again, this is one of one of the points that I, uh, you know, uh, go back to is there are the empiricists and there are the rationalists. And you could see naively machine learning as being the triumph of the empiricists, hmm. but it actually is not. There are very fundamental reasons why it's not. And I really do think, and, and, and this is not just think, there's this thing called the no free lunch theorem, mm -hmm. right? And if you take those things seriously, the solution has to be a combination of empiricism and rationalism. I don't think either side alone has or even can have the whole answer. So very much we need both of those. And if you're a pure empiricist or a pure rationalist, I'm already suspicious of you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, coming back to what Francois uh, uh, said in, in his quote, he said, you know, producing things that are thought provoking, novel and, and all the rest of it. And I was speaking to some alignment folks yesterday and we'll pivot to that in a minute. But the, the big thing for me after doing an episode on Searle's The Chinese Room is, you know, where does intentionality come from? And Chomsky talks about um, agency, for example, we do things that are appropriate to the situation, but not caused mm -hmm. by them. So from my perspective, all these generative models, all these large language models and so on, the creativity, the, the real spark of genius still comes from us, right? We've just kind of like, um, you know, the, the, the boring bit of actually doing the task is, is now um, delegated to the algorithm. I would disagree with that. I think you are, um, I mean, your position is very reasonable and actually, I would say, probably the most common. But hmm. I think when you do that, you are giving us too much credit and the large language models too little. Hmm. We tend to have this notion that creativity is something magical. In fact, I remember for many years, so quick parenthesis, in a previous life, I was a musician. So, you know, I, in some sense, know about and a lot of my job was composing songs, right? And I was always, at the same time, I was already studying AI. And I couldn't help but connect the two, right? And, and mm -hmm. think about like, what would an AI look that was able to compose music, right? And, and talking to lay people who are not musicians, they think that composing songs is some kind of magic thing that comes from, yeah. you know, whatever, the great beyond. And it's not. Yeah. It's a very human enterprise. And it can very well be automated. It's actually now, you know, people, I used to say to people like, People always say like, oh, creativity will be the last thing that we automate because we humans can do it and there's no machine screw. And I'd be like, no, it's going to be the opposite. You'll automate creativity long before many other things. And we're there now, right? In just the last... So I think when you... Let me put it this way. Your prompt to the LLM, let's say, mm. is like the grain of sand to the oyster, mm. right? Mm. You should not give yourself credit for having made the pearl because you put the grain of sand in there. That's a, right. that's a brilliant analogy. Right? Yeah. So it is it's still the LLA. We need to, we, want, we can critique how creative it is or not, and there's a lot to be said there and a lot of progress to be made, but, but we need to give it credit for what it does, right? It, it is that well or not so well, right? Maybe mm -hmm. it's more of an illusion that we're giving it credit for and whatnot, but that text or that image or whatever, they were created yeah. by the AI. And in many ways, the thing that was created by the AI is no worse than, than what would have been created by a, an artist if I gave them the prompt. No, okay, well, on, on that, I agree with you. I mean, uh, Melanie Mitchell had this wonderful um, anecdote from the Googleplex when she was with Douglas Hofstadter. Mm. And uh, he was talking at the time about, you know, how he would be devastated if uh, an AI could produce a Chopin uh, piece, you know, which was indistinguishable from, from, from one which he actually created. And, and of course, that did happen. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but, but th then we get into this discussion of um, where does it start, right? Where does it start? Computers only do what we tell them to do, right? They've been trained... Um, and actually, I was speaking to um, to Sepp about this the other day. That you know, all of the abstractions, all of the things that that the computers and the models do, they are crystallized snapshots of things that humans have previously done. And we've written the computer pro uh, uh, code. So where does the creativity start? Well, uh, but we, by that standard, 
we humans also only do what we're told to do. Wow. We do what we're told to do by our genes. Our genes do what they're told to do by evolution, which does what it's told to do by the laws of physics. Right? Uh, uh, right. right? And now, again, this gets back to this notion that there's nothing magical about creativity. Creativity really is, to a large extent, cutting and pasting stuff and satisfying consistency constraints between them. And I'm not just saying this in the abstract. Like, long before the modern era, there's this guy called David Cope, mm. uh, you know, a professor of, a composer and professor of music at UC Santa Cruz, who created these programs that exactly they would write, they, they can write, this was pre-machine learning, right? It was Lisp code that what it did was basically have rules about how music should be. And then it takes snippets and combines them, right? You could say it's just parroting those bits, but the truth is at the end of the day, and you can choose, you say like, give me something in the style of Mozart. And it creates something yeah. by that looks indistinguishable from, from what Mozart did. But all it's doing is this kind of recombination of pieces. So we humans, we, we have too much respect for appreciation for our own intelligence. That's also what we're doing. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. I mean, first of all, intelligence is a receding horizon and there's the McCorduck effect. And, <laughs> exactly. And I, I agree with, with all of that. But um, yeah, um, I, I think it's a similar thing to how we anthropomorphize um, large language models. And, and even, you know, it's tempting to say large language models are slightly conscious. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But, <laughs> but, but maybe like um, we also anthropomorphize our own agency, right? We have like a little bubble around ourselves yeah. and we kind of delude ourselves that we exist as, as, as an individual unit with agency um, disconnected from the rest of the world. Well, precisely the problem with how we largely take AI today, this has always been the case, by the way, is that we have an irresistible notion to anthropomorphize anything that behaves even remotely like us. Hmm. We're the only intelligent things that we know, so if something starts behaving intelligently, then we project onto it all of these other human characteristics. Hmm. Same with consciousness, same with creativity. We don't know anything else that's creative besides us, so once a machine starts behaving creatively, we cannot help but project a lot of things onto it. It's just reasoning by analogy, mm. right? Mm. So it's, it's a kind of analogic So like you're like me in this respect, so you probably are in this other respect. Now, the good news is that we always start out with this kind of very crude reasoning by analogy, but after a while, we actually start to build a model of the real thing. So mm. AI for the public at large right now is very new, but gradually we'll come to a point where we, where we zero in on what AI really is, rather than just the shallow analogies that we initially used to try to understand. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try it from a slightly different angle. So, you know, um, we were just saying Searle makes the argument that it's a biological property and that's where intentionality and consciousness comes from and it's a requisite. But um, we'll, we'll leave that for, for the time being. Let's, let's go the, um, you know, the Foda and the, the Gary Marcus and, and the Chomsky route. And they would argue that creativity is basically this, this notion of, or even analogy making for, by extension, is this notion of being able to select from um, a, you know, a set which has an infinite cardinality. And, the only, and as you know, neural networks can't represent uh, infinite sets because they're finite state automatas. Therefore, they make the move we need to have this compositionality. What do you say to that? Well, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. I think we definitely need compositionality, right? Mm. If somebody asked me, make a list of half a dozen things that are absolutely essential for intelligence, compositionality would be one of them, right? Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is, is the thing that people like, you know, Chomsky and, 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 and Gary and whatnot really care about, right? Mm -hmm. Having said that, I think, first of all, there is no such thing as an infinite set, mm -hmm. right? Like, infinite set is a, is a infinity is a, is a useful but extremely dangerous and confusing mathematical tool. Right? In the real world, there is no such thing as an infinite anything, and there never will be. So I would rephrase this at, well, yes, creativity and almost anything we can do in AI is selecting from a very large set, not infinite, but very large, mm -hmm. right? And now, but now we don't just select like one full element at a time. We compose it out of pieces, and that's actually where the intelligence comes in. Interesting. I don't want to go too far down the digital physics route, but we did just have Joshua Bark on. And um, I mean, just, just to re-clarify on that, would, would you place yourself in, in that camp that the universe is digital and made of information? Uh, valid question. I certainly think the universe is finite. Yeah. I, I think whether, the, I mean, to, you know, like Seth Lloyd says, the universe, the, the universe is a computer, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is true or false depending on what you take the word computer to mean. Right? The universe is not little. So if you, if you say that the universe is digital or is a computer as kind of like an analogy that lets us understand it better, I'm all for that. 
I don't think the universe is little, you know, maybe here's a way to put this. The universe is a computation. Mm. Like, I don't know what the computer is or if there is one. Now, the universe is digital in the sense that deep down at the most basic level, the universe is made of discrete things. Okay, is this like the it from bit, the John Wheeler type hypo hypothesis? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, if you read that paper, uh, it, he's, I mean, John Wheeler was a brilliant person. Hmm. Uh, again, a very, you know, to get back to Francois Chollet's, uh, you know, tweet, he was very good at coming up with these provocative notions, right? Yeah. And the it from bit thing, of course, is like newly unvoked today. And I do, so at that level, I do agree that looking at the universe as being made of information mm. is very useful. And in particular, if you want a grand unified mass style algorithm, in some sense, the only way that I at least can see of doing that is by seeing everything as information. Yeah. So I think, and in fact, there's something that I am working on, that looking at everything as information is a very productive thing to do. Yeah. But, but I, the, my caution is that Information is one aspect of everything. So I can give you a theory of everything that's based on information, mm. but it's not tr truly a theory of everything. It's a theory of one aspect of everything. And I think there's a lot to be done there. But again, we shouldn't forget what we're leaving out when we focus on that aspect. Yeah, I mean, we, we've spoken a lot on the show about, you know, um, uh, Penrose's view and, and obviously Sowell's view that arises uh, from, from biology. And, and I know if Keith was here, he would argue strongly that he believes in, in continuum. And therefore, we would need you know, hypercomputation uh, to, to have this universe. That would be an interesting discussion to have because I really don't see where there is physical or any evidence for continuum of any kind. Mm -hmm. The evidence is always that continuum are a useful approximation, but always underlying the continuum is a discrete reality. You take a sensor of anything, right? You know, quantum mechanics is like the quintessential example of this, right? What do we measure at the end of the day? It's always discrete events, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like it's the detection of a photon by, uh, you know, by whatever detector, right? Could be a model of, of, of Dobson or a CCD or whatever, but it's a, it's, a, it's a change of state. It really is a bit. Oh, interesting. Well, how would you contrast that? You know, um, Stephen Wolfram has got this idea of, of um, digital physics and, you know, m maybe, and, and again, unfortunately, we have to use arguments from behavior you know, to kind of say, well, we've, we've got potentially a, um, a graph cellular automata, and it creates this beautiful emergent structure, which is very much like the universe. Um, but, you know, um, uh, Scott Aronson would make the argument that, that he's discounting quantum mechanics. I mean, what, what would you say to that? <laughs> uh, so I think Steve Wolfram's theory is very interesting, and he gets some things right that a lot of other physicists don't, uh, in particular that the universe at heart is discrete. So I'm very much with him on that aspect of his agenda. Hmm. Uh, and thank God there's someone like him and a number of others, you know, going that route, right? They're the minority in physics. But actually, I think if you look at just what has happened in the last 10 years, things are very much moving in this direction. And I think they're going to move more, right? Hmm. Now, having said that, his specific theory, I think, has a lot of shortcomings. Uh, and I don't think it's the ultimate theory or maybe even the best path to a theory. Uh, you know, to a discrete theory of the universe. Scott Aronson's um, critique in that regard, I think, misses the point, right? It's interesting, it's interesting that you should like pair those two because Steve Wolfram, in a way, is a physicist who became a computer scientist and Scott is the other way around, right? And I think, you know, like, I greatly admire both of them and I'm friends with both of them. I've had many discussions with them. I think, you know, just to very, you know, cruelly caricature two things, in a way, the problem with Steve is that he has bought into the computer science assumptions too much. Mm. And the problem with, with Scott is that he has bought into the quantum physics assumptions too much, right? So if you really think carefully and rigorously about quantum mechanics, all that continuous mathematics is there just to make discrete predictions. Mm. So the continuity may be useful. It is useful. I'm not arguing against the use of continuity and infinity in our mathematics. In fact, we'd be nowhere if we didn't have it. We just have to remember that it's an approximation. It's a useful fiction. Right? So quantum mechanics in no way uh, invalidates Steve Wolfram's theories, right? The problem, however, is that he has not entirely, you know, ever since cellular automata days, right, he was always saying like, oh, you know, the laws of physics will come out of this cellular automata, right? And people had these objections and, and you know, now he and others have partly answered some of them, but the truth is at the end of the day, he, the, the only way to answer that objection is to say, look, here is how quantum mechanics arises from my discrete model of the world. And I think this will happen, but it, but it hasn't happened yet. 
Interesting. Okay, we'd love to get Stephen on the show. Actually, he's, he's got a he's got a new um, book out now, which is kind of like expanding on on, on his previous work. Yeah. But um, okay, um, I was having a chat with um, uh, some alignment folks yesterday, mm. and uh, it's something that I, that I'm a bit naive to. But as I said, I've, I've just read a book. Um, I think it's called The Rationalist's Guide to the uh, to the Universe, and it kind of talks all about the um, the early embryonic stages of Robin Hanson and uh, Nick Bostrom and Eliezer Yudkowsky and the Less Wrong community, and you know the info hazards and um, you know, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Rocco's Basilicist and, and all, all of this line, line of thought, basically. And um, yeah, so where, where to go with this? Now, I, I kind of um, put forward that part of my problem uh, with their conception is that it relies on this rational agent making trajectories of optimal decisions. And um, also they, um, they tend to be utilitarianism and uh, utilitarianists and consequentialists. And um, yeah, I just wondered, what, what's your kind of like high level take on this? Well, there's many aspects to this, right? I think, let me put it this way. I, a rational agent, right, is an agent that maximizes, a, a, maximizes expected utility, right? The mm -hmm. definition of rationality is that it's, you know, expected utility maximization, mm -hmm. right? And there is a lot of content to this. Right, and you know, people in many fields like economics and and, they, and you know AI, right? Uh, they make good use of it. It doesn't answer the question of what is the utility that you're maximizing, mm. right? So, if you give me a utility function right now, if you maximize it, you're rational. You can it can be bound you can be boundedly rational because you're and indeed that's this is the interesting and prevalent case is that you can only maximize it within bounds and you have to make compromises, satisfies and whatnot. But still, you're rational. If you don't do that, you are irrational, right? So rationality is a very, you know, like so many mistakes that we make as a society, as individuals would be avoided if only we were rational in that sense. So at that level, I sympathize very much with that view of the world. Having said that, there's a huge gaping hole in the middle of this, which is like, but what is your utility function, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, one attitude is to say like, oh, that's for you to decide, you know, you, you, you tell what me what utility function is, but, but then you, you, you're, you're entitled to say, well, like, but like, my whole problem is that I want to figure out what my utility function should be. And, and at that point, this whole theory of rationality just doesn't help you at all. The utility function is an input, right? So now the question becomes, what is your utility function, right? And then there's a very related, but as Hume said, very different question, which is like, what should your utility function be like? Should is a very loaded word here, right? And then what, what usually happens is things like this, is that our notions of morality and so on are trying to impose a should on you Hmm. a utility function that you should have because it serves the utility of the society. Now, from the point of view of the society, this is good, right? But from the point of view, because the society hopefully will live and prosper if its elements contribute to its utility, not just their own, right? But it still doesn't answer the question. So you can, you're entitled to ask, so what does answer the question, right? And my view on this is that none of these people, and uh, these people include Kant and Bentham and, you know, Plato and everybody, right? They, you can't do that, right? The, 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 so to me, the supreme reality of life, supreme maybe is a, is a, is a bad word, but like the overarching reality is evolution, mm. right? Mm. Everything we are is created by evolution. And as somebody famously said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Nothing in morality makes sense except in the light of evolution, not just biological evolution, even though that's part of it, but also social and cultural evolution. So at the end of the day, the question that you need to ask yourself is like, is which utility functions are fitter and those yeah. are the ones that will prevail? So, so let, let's, let's go there. That's really interesting. Now, um, you, you're known as a skeptic of collectivist thought, mm -hmm. right? We know, and, and right. there's this interesting dichotomy we were talking about of, you know, um, monolithic truth. But right. um, the utility function is interesting as well, because in a sense, it, I mean, I, I know these folks are consequentialists, but in, in a sense, that's more leaning towards deontology. Uh, I, I did it again, <laughs> deontology, <laughs> um, you know, which is this idea that, that, that we have kind of like a principled um, approach to, um, to morality. And I'm, I'm skeptical as well that it's possible to create such a utility function because it wouldn't really be parsimonious. But how, how do you wrestle that, that, that you have um, a simple utility function, even though you believe in, in diversity of ideas? Oh, no, I didn't say simple. Go on. Crucial point. The utility function could be extremely complex. And in fact, the utility function, so first of all, there's, there's more than one level to this. You to, let's say you believe in utilitarianism, hmm. right? Which I don't, but have, you know, Compared to the others, it's probably the least bad, right? Yeah. Believing in 
If you believe in maximizing a utility function, that in no way sanctions collectivism. Collectivism is one particular strand that historically came out of that, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, again, and Bentham is responsible for it, but it's this notion that you should have a utility function in which everybody counts equally. This is now making a choice of utility function, which is different from having one. Okay, okay but, but I think you're saying something quite interesting as well, which is that at the moment, the, the utility is a function of market value, which is very much inspired by Adam Smith's um, hidden hand of, of the market. But, but I, th I think y your, your views against collectivism is very much against this idea of a quality of outcome, and that's definitely not what you're saying. No, I mean, that's even going beyond that, right? Equality of outcome is actually irrational, frankly. To, to, we could go into that. But, you know, you mentioned the market, right? And the market is decides utility. Again, that is a, a one way to decide. I mean, that is also a very crude approximation to what you really want. Hmm. So actually all we have, whether it's capitalism or economism at this point, in terms of utility function, are very imperfect, right? Uh, and that's even saying it generously. And really our job is to try to come up with something better, which I totally think we can, right? Yeah. And yeah. by the way, one very salient question here, which again, uh, for economists, it's very salient, is this uh, question of like, should you have one utility function, overarching, controlling everything, mm -hmm. even if it's complex, right? Mm -hmm. Or should you not, mm -hmm. right? And, and that, that, I, that I think is a very interesting question, right? And there are, there are good arguments in both directions, right? So let me just give you one silly example, which then I think also generalizes to other things. Does your brain have a single utility function? And I think the answer is no. Now, you could say from an evolutionary point of view, the overarching utility is fitness, but then the way that cashes out in your brain is that your, your genes need con to control this adaptive machine, right? Mm -hmm. In such a way that it give, you, give, you give the machine freedom, mm -hmm. right? To do things that the genes by themselves couldn't. But at the same time, at the end of the day, that machine has to subserve the propagation of those genes. And the way you do this, right? At least the way evolution seems to have done it, and I think it makes a lot of sense, is that you don't just have one utility. You have several ones which correspond to your emotions. And then they fight it out. So I actually think there's this connection between rationality and the emotion that people don't make, which is that, you know, your emotions are really your utility functions. You just have different ones that cater to different things, right? You know, fear and anger and so on. And so I think in reality, we actually have multiple utility functions, but because, again, it gets to this problem that what we're trying to do is approximate something that is very complex and difficult to get at. Mm. Maybe it is just one, but we're better off for trying to approximate it with 10 or 20 different things than just trying to nail that one thing. Uh, that's really interesting. And, and it, is your view then on having this diversity of utility functions analogous to your views on the master algorithm? Huh. It's analogous, but you're actually talking about different dimensions, right? You could make a table where on one side you have all the different utilities, and then on the other side you have the algorithms, and now you can pair off any, any one of them. I can say, I'm going to you know, pursue this, you know, minimize your fear using symbolism, or minim right? so any combination is valid. Mm, mm, really, really interesting. Okay, and then um, let, let's get into meritocracy, for example. So at, at the moment, we do have the market system, and presumably you think that some people do genuinely have more market value than others. For sure. No, and by the way, I think I, I'm definitely a big believer in meritocracy. I think... Um, but what does it mean to you? Right, very good. So let's, yep. let's get that down first, right? <clears throat> Meritocracy, so our goal is to have a society that, that functions best and provides best for everybody, right? Uh, and I mean, we could refine even that, but let's just take that for now as our assumption, right? But then if that is the case, one of our primary goals, maybe even the most important one, is to get everybody to contribute the most they can. Right? Mm -hmm. Meritocracy is often seen as like, I'm going to rank all the people and at the top is the greatest genius and the, at the bottom is the most useless person. And this is wrong. Right? Meritocracy is a many dimension thing. Yeah. Right? The goal of meritocracy is to find for everybody what they're best at doing mm -hmm. so that they can do it. Mm -hmm. Maximize everybody's contribution to society. Right? And, and this is a very complicated process. There isn't a single scale of intelligence or anything else. Having said that, it very much is the case that some people are better for some things than others, right? And if you deny that, you are actually in the process of destroying the society and making it dysfunctional. So the attack, I find the attacks on meritocracy extremely disturbing, right? 
And a lot of them are, you know, I've talked with many people who have those beliefs, right? And the number one thing that they say is, is basically boils down to like, oh, meritocracy isn't perfect, so we should junk it. Hmm. Something being not being perfect has never been a reason to junk it. It's a reason to improve it. So there's a lot of room to improve in meritocracy, but if you throw it away, you are destroying society. Well, I mean, this, 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 um, you can trace this back to our argument about utility. But um, the thing is, though, if we had um, a, a value function which represented actual market contributions or, or even societal contributions, that would be one thing. But would you agree that, that we have a lot of um, game playing at the moment? So utility is based on playing the success game or the dominance game or the virtue game, as Will Storr said in, in his book. So we've got these kind of emerging games and it's like it's not really um, representing utility. Well, absolutely. So, so far we've been talking about utility, right? But what happens in the real world is that there are multiple agents, each with their own different utility. Hmm. And at this point, what you have is game theory, right? Game theory is just what you have when there's not a single optimization going on but multiple optimizations, which are partly contradictory, maybe partly not. So the best way to understand everything that we've been talking about, including society and evolution, and even what happens inside your brain, is as a big game. A much bigger and more complex game than game theorists and economists and so on, and evolutionary biologists, right, prominently, have been able to handle in the past, but I think they are very much in the right track and we can understand a lot of these phenomena that you're referring to as they are games being played by people that have certain utilities right mm -hmm. and now you are going to impose your you, you know like and it's a game right i don't you don't know who's going to win until you actually do the linear program uh, and and figure out how this is gonna you know uh, and of course games are you know uh, in reality you know most games are not single round games right they, they're, they're continuing games right so things get very, very interesting. But this, I think, is the most productive way to look at all of this. Okay, good, good. But, but then some, some might say that this is a, a platonic way of looking at the world. And the world is actually much more complicated than that. And again, we're kind of fooled by randomness because we're anthropomorphizing the world and we're kind of framing it as a game. It might be much more complicated than that. Um, I've, I've already said this a couple of times, but you know, the, the concept of power, for example, did when Napoleon said, I want the men to march into this, com uh, into this country. Is it just a simple kind of chain of command that goes down? No, it's not. It's so much more complicated than that. Well, yes, but that's... I'm, I, actually, I'm not even sure what you mean by when you say it's much more complicated than a game. Again, when I say a game, maybe what comes to your mind is something simple like, you know, Prisoner's Dilemma, two, two players, two moves. It's a game with, you know, with a vast number of players, each with a vast number of moves. Interesting, but, but I think this gets to the core of what the rationalists talk about. They, they, they have these thought experiments, they talk about prisoner's dilemma. They have, the, I'm, I forget the name of that game where there's the two boxes and you have to choose the, the, the box, I, I forget that. But I guess what I'm saying is, is that if you do have this rationalist conception of the world and, and think about it in terms of game, of game theory, just like the, um, the symbolists do and the people who handcraft cognitive architectures do, or even with causality, for example, we create these variables. It's all anthropomorphic. Well, um... I would not, so let me, let me put it this way, right? You can model almost anything, can is an important word here, you can model almost anything in the world, in any domain, from physics to psychology to sociology, you name it, as optimizing a function. Whether you should is a debatable question, but you can, hmm. right? But now, what really happens is that there are many different optimizations going on at the same time all the way from maximizing entropy to me deciding what I have for lunch today. And now what you have is all of these interlocking optimizations, and that's what I'm calling game theory, right? One of those optimizations is I'm Napoleon, I want to conquer Russia, you're the Tsar of Russia, you don't want to be conquered, right? And then we play a very complicated game, which includes other agents, like your soldiers, which maybe, you know, I, a French soldier, you know, want to conquer Russia, but I also want to stay alive. Whereas Napoleon really couldn't care less whether I, in particular, stay alive or not, as long as he conquers Russia in the end. So th this very complex game, I think, is what goes on. I don't think framing things in this way is anthropomorphizing them. In fact, I think this is our best hope to not anthropomorphize things. Although, at the end of the day, I think you can look at almost anything and see a ghost of anthropomorphization there. But if there's a less anthropomorphic way to look at the universe than through this lens, I'd be interested to see what it is.
Well, the, the, the only reason I'm saying this is, first of all, I, I want to play devil's advocate a little bit. And um, we, we even spoke about the blind men and the elephant a little while ago. Right. And um, I'm sure folks on the left, as they did, they criticized Ayan Rand, for example, and, and they said that she had this very transactional way of, of you know, viewing the world as this kind of Nash equilibrium of, of self-interested actors. And are we guilty of doing that? Are we, are we kind of like cutting off many aspects of the truth by doing this? I guess that's what I'm saying. So... We are always cutting off some aspect of the truth when we look at anything in any way, right? Which is not a reason to, to look at nothing in no way, right? So I think this is a very productive way to look at things, but not the only one. It doesn't exhaust what there is to be said, but I personally feel like it's the one where the most progress can, can come from. Interesting. Right? Now, that sort of like Ayn Randian simplification of the world, I, the... the Looking at things this way does not imply oversimplifying them. On the contrary, I would actually say it gives us a handle on how to go into the complexity and not get lost and, and not devolve into like platitudes or oversimplifying ideologies, right? Mm. The fact that there's a mathematical component to this is very important, right? Mathematics, when you can apply it, gives you a very solid handle on things. We are now at the point where we can handle a lot of things mathematically slash computationally that we couldn't before. So when von Neumann invented game theory, right, he said, this is the future of the social sciences. Mm -hmm. And so far it hasn't been. But I think we're actually now at the point where, partly because we have the data, right? We actually can now usefully apply this point of view in a way that we couldn't before. How far it takes us, we'll see. It's not the only possible way to look at things, but I do think it's probably the most productive at this point. Interesting, okay. So coming back to this rationalist school of thought, um, one thing that I'm interested in is is um, morality. But let's let's go one step at a time. So um, I, I think Bostrom came up with this idea of instrumental convergence, which is this, this notion that in the pursuit of doing a particular task, the um, the intelligence system might actually um, potentially kill everyone on on the planet or, or do adjacent tasks. And this is this is where the interesting thing comes from. So one task, uh, but adjacent uh, multitask ability and and a, you know like potential intelligence and so on. So um, there was an example of, of a cauldron. So, you know, um, you, you, you've got someone filling up a cauldron and in the pursuit of filling up the cauldron to just the right level, they, they might kill the person who looks after the, the, the cauldron room just to, so, so that the right. agent could do it more efficiently. Um, are, are, you, are you cynical about that or, or what do you think? No, I'm not cynical about that, but let me put it this way. I don't lose any sleep worrying about the, you know, paperclip factory that's going to take over the world, right? I think you have to take that as a philosopher's thought experiment, right? Uh, you know, the philosopher being Nick in this case, right? I think there's a, the, there's a real danger that that's putting its finger on, hmm. but it's not, but it's also um, mistaking reality for something else. So let's look at both parts of that, right? The real danger is that um, if you give an AI a, 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 an oversimplified, a hugely oversimplified objective function, and at the same time a very large amount of power, bad things will happen. And we need to worry about that, mm -hmm. right? So, and by the way, this is already a problem today in, in many, maybe more modest ways, but, many, but also more relevant, frankly, right? And so what do you do, right? First of all is the utility function needs to be as rich and as complex and as subtle as the people that it's trying to serve. Mm. Right. So you as long as what you have to take a really world example today, social media, who's, you know, are all designed to just maximize engagement. Right. You have an enormous amount of AI at the service of maximizing engagement. It's a very I understand why companies do it. And partly they have the right to. We can get into that. But the point is the, the, the consequence, it's ignoring too many things. Right. So one line of defense against is like you have to enrich utility function until mm. it's like a bed, and then it's, this is an open-ended problem, right? We're, ne we're never gonna have the final utility function. It's something that the AIs have to be continually, you know, AIs, I think Stuart Russell said this, and I agree, like they should spend half their time figuring out what the utility function is, and then the other half maximizing it. Whereas today, it's like, I wrote down my utility function in one line, and now I spend this enormous amount of power maximizing it. So that's one line. The mm. other line, or like one other line is, you have to put constraints on the machine, hard constraints. You can, in the pursuit of this utility function, you can think of it as like, you know, terms with infinite weight in the utility function. You can't go outside this. And then the other one is, the single biggest reason why sort of like this paperclip experiment is silly is that 
you know, along with that paperclip factory in the world, there are going to be a million other AIs, you know, each of which is doing the same thing. So none of them is ever going to acquire the power to cause that damage unless it's doing something very different from just trying to make paperclips. So at some level, that ex example is extremely unrealistic and leads us down the wrong track. Right, loads of places to go there. But um, first of all, I think you do believe in AI alignment then because you're saying exactly the same as what they do, which is that we need to have a utility function that represents the, the richness of, of the human condition. So that's the first thing. So, so essentially, you're, you're all on board with alignment. Well, I believe in AI alignment in one sense of it. Many different things get go under that umbrella of AI alignment, right? Right. I think in the near term, thinking of things, in t I mean, if a light... Let me put it this way. If AI alignment is just trying to have a really accurate utility function, then yes. And then the machines are optimizing that function, absolutely, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and in the near term, I think talking about AI alignment is a little, I mean, the problem that I have with the concept of AI alignment is that it goes far beyond that. It tends to see AIs as these independent agents that uh, we have to align their goals to ours, right? Yeah. And, and, and if that just cashes out as like, you know, here's the utility function, that's fine. But the problem is AIs are not independent agents. AIs are our tools. Well, to, just to push back on that uh, a little bit, because I always had that conception of these folks. I, I thought I was arguing against people who believed in a pure monolithic intelligence. And, the, and they, um, a lot of them are transhumanists, actually, and, and they say that they, they want to um, you know, ensure human flourishing through the kind of the use of, of AIs in tandem, almost as a kind of extended mind from, from David Chalmers. And, but, but then um, I really wanted to get into their fears of recursive self-improving um, intelligence and superintelligence, because when you do have this kind of um, heterogeneous approach to humans and, and machines, there are going to be bottlenecks everywhere. Now, I, I like to think of it a bit like the market efficiency hypothesis, which is that you reach an, an equilibrium where um, you know uh, the the individual actors in the market become more efficient, we'll become more efficient programmers because we're using codex. But we will reach a limit, surely. Well, um, to touch on transhumanism for just a second, right? Because I do agree with you, kind of at least sociologically, a lot of that crowd is the same, right? Let me put it this way, right? And I'm sure this is a controversial statement, but maybe in the long run, the AS should take over the world. Mm. Why are we so arrogant that we think? whatever the AI is, it should always be there to serve us. You know, we are a step, if you take the long view of this, right, we're a step in evolution, right? We're amazing. Maybe I'm a human chauvinist, but I do think we are amazing. But we're not the last word, right? So, you know, the other day I tweeted something that, you know, is, you know, maybe provocative, but it's like, uh, um, I think in Gamsplates, which is, I said that the killer app of humans is producing AI. Maybe our role in evolution is that we're going to produce an AI, right? That is, you know, the next level of whatever you like, consciousness, intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so the notion that in the very long term, the AI is that should still be there to subserve us by this point of view is actually silly, right? Right. But a lot, okay, so I mean, a lot, a lot of um, folks, let's say the ethics folks would find it horrifying that, and, and I was speaking to Irina actually yesterday, and she, and she, she said something uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, which is that we should. To actually, who, sorry? Uh, Irina from uh, Montreal Mila. Um, oh, yeah. Irina Arish, right? Oh, yeah, I know her, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We she, were classmates at UC Irvine. Amazing, yeah. She's, I, I really love her. But um, no, she was kind of joking that we should almost align human values to the, to the AGI values. But, but, well, I, that, that I find alarming. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think she was saying it tongue in cheek. She was I'm not alarmed by a lot of things, but yeah. <laughs> But, but, but what, do you, what do you think about this, um, uh, this ethical concern that if, that if it is the case that you believe that, you know, we're just one rung on the ladder and, you know, transhumanism is, is more AI than, than it is human, um, people would find that horrifying. Well, uh, I, I understand why people would find that horrifying. And I mean, again, we have to distinguish the short from the medium from the long term. When I say something like this, I'm talking about the very long term, Right. Trying to make human subservience subservient to AI today is a horrifying idea. Right? Mm. Now, I think the reason a lot of people are, are horrified with this idea, period, right, is natural, but in my view, naive. It's just they are uh, seeing humans as the end goal. Okay, if but... humans are the end goal, then the idea that they should be subservient to developing the, the next level of AI is horrifying. If you have a moral system, Hmm. where humans are the, 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 the be-all and end-all, then all of this is horrifying. 
But again, if you take the long view of evolution, humans are not the be all and end all. Okay, I mean, eventually this might take us to the effective altruism discussion, but um, I, I think, uh, as we were saying, Sam Harris recently had a podcast talking about the FTX disaster, and, and he was kind of making the argument that we're all consequentialists, even, even if we don't realize it, but there are different degrees of consequentialism. And I think a lot of the, um, uh, the ethics folks at the moment, they really, really don't like what's going on with, with long-termism. And it's because there's this slippery slope of the kind of horizon of consequentialism. So with Nick Bostrom, you know, he came up with this number that there could be simulated humans, you know, living on other planets in the future. It's a very big number. I think it's like, you know, it's got, it's got a lot of zeros on it. And what's, what's to stop us from just making the argument and what's to stop AIs from making the argument that those simulated lives have more value than our lives? Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so, but let's take this one step at a time. I very much buy the idea of effective altruism on principle, right? I think that is the way to go about a lot of things. I think in some ways, uh, if you are not an effective altruist, maybe unconsciously, you are being irrational or maybe evil, right? If you believe in altruism, I mean, like, think about both parts of that, right? If altruism is good, then, then we're, let's say we take that, right? And then why should, we, why should you be in favor of ineffective altruism, right? If you're, an, if you're an altruist, if you want the good of other people, you should try to do the best you can, right? And so, for example, I very much buy the notion that, like, you want to, you know, make the most money you can so then you can give away that money as opposed to volunteering at the soup kitchen. Volunteering at the soup kitchen for, say, someone with a PhD in machine learning is, is an ineffective form of altruism. Now, having said that, I think the focus on the long term has been in many ways, I mean, Certainly the long term is important, right? But, but the problem with the whole effect of altruism movement is that it got overly focused on that. And we can talk about why. And then even, even, and then a further mistake is that it got overly focused on these supposedly existential dangers that are much less of a big deal than people think like AI. So between yeah. effective altruism and, and fixating on AI as an existential danger lies a huge gulf. I'm for effective altruism. I think, you know, the long, long term, you know, there's ins and outs there, right? And then this focus on like these existential dangers is, is, is very problematic. You know, for example, you know, to get back to the, you know, Bostromian notion of like all these minds that matter more than us and whatnot, mm. there is a basic idea, right, that like any economist knows, which is that you have to discount the future. And the mm. question is what, your, is what your discount rate is, right? Mm. And if your discount rate is high, right, those, those minds matter not at all. And now why do you have that discount rate? The primary reason is that there's uncertainty about the future, right? I have to weigh the, the certain benefit of helping you today with the increasingly hypothetical benefit of helping a mind that is less and less likely to exist in the future. So in many of those cases, the present and the short term do win. Okay, but a, a couple of things to contrast that. So a lot of um, effective altruism is, is this idea that we're born with faulty programming, right? So we, we, um, we have these views, you know, like we, we have this concept of, of moral um, value and it gets discounted in space and time, right? So we need ways of overcoming our programming. But you were saying that we, sh we should be um, thinking about this, but contrast that with your, um, you know, with, with your statement about Ayn Rand earlier, right? So Ayn Rand was very, very transactional because I think the, um, the folks that criticize this movement um, are suspicious that we are actually being a bit more like Ayn Rand, um, but with the guise of, of altruism. And I think that, and they, they, they think of the FTX disaster as being kind of like evidence of that? Uh, a lot of different points there. The FTX disaster actually has nothing whatsoever to do with any of this, hmm. right? Sam bankman fried was one guy, or is one guy, funny that I use the past tense. He's one <laughs> guy who believed in effective altruism, good for him, right? He was, I mean, the whole FTX thing was also obviously, I mean, yeah, we could get into that, but the point is you, you should not, I understand why people's image of effective altruism would be tainted by what happened with Sam Beckman fried but really it shouldn't be, yeah. right? You know, an idea is not responsible for the, you know, mistakes that its believers make in, 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 in unrelated domains, point one. Point two, transactionalism. There is nothing in what I've said whatsoever that implies transactionalism, in fact, the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. I think relationalism is, is actually the, the key concept. And part of this is that, uh, Games are not one shot. Your games are played in a repeated way. And famously, for example, if you play things like Prisoner's Dilemma and whatnot, repeated, like you know, like, you know cooperate, defect, and whatnot, as soon as you start bringing in these other things, like that make things more realistic, you actually start to get behavior that is much more 
you know, what's the way to put it, rational in some ways and, and human and whatnot, right? Another one is that traditional economics, which I think Ayn Rand was influenced by, viewed and still views the world as linear, but the world is nonlinear. Mm -hmm. Once you start seeing the world as nonlinear, all of these things really change, you know, the face of them changes, right? So I think we have to look at all these concepts in this view, right? And, and we want to focus on the long, so, I, so, I, so to, get, to go back to your first point, right, we are born with faulty programming. Mm -hmm. Part of our, and that's what, if, you know, effective altruism is there to overcome, right? Part of our faulty programming is that our discount rate is too high. Because we evolved in a world where your time horizon was very short. The fact that it's too high doesn't mean that we should make it zero and care only about the future. But what would, the, you know, the ethics folks who um, advocate for gatekeeping and paternalism, um, couldn't you just say that they're doing the same thing? Well, you should ask them, right? But wouldn't, wouldn't, they, wouldn't they lead by saying our programming is faulty and therefore, you know, we, we need to... No, I mean, look, uh, we can... So, part one, we can debate whether our programming is faulty or not and why. And so, to just start by touching on that, our programming is faulty. So our programming is not faulty in the sense that we evolved for a particular set of conditions, hmm. right? And that evolution may not be complete or optimal, et cetera, et cetera. But roughly speaking, we are not faulty in that sense. The reason, because evolution is doing its job, right? We have all those impulses for a reason, hmm. right? Now, the problem is that we, unlike any other species, we actually have actually succeeded in creating a world that is better for us, but at the same time, and this is the problem, we are actually now adapted to a different world from the one that we live in. Mm -hmm. So the faulty program just comes from the fact that we evolved for one set of conditions. For example, among many other examples where your time horizon was very short, mm -hmm. and now we live in a very different world. And so our job as rational people, that's what our rational minds are for, among other things, is to now adapt ourselves to the world that we really are in so that we do things that are rational in the world that we're in, right? So now, the fact that our programming is faulty does not, in, does not say anything about what are the faults and how you fix them. And what these people have, I think, is first of all, the wrong notion of what our faults are, and then on top of that, the wrong notion of how to fix them. Okay, now I wanna get into the utility function again. Now, again, one of the things that makes me skeptical is, is this notion of immutability both of, of what we're doing and, and in the case of, of what we've been speaking about with, with uh, utilitarianism, what the utility function is. Now, you were kind of hinting to something interesting before, which is that, that it might be diverse and it might also be self-updating. But I'm constantly asking myself the question, how does that work and who gets to say? Well, so very much, I think it's complex and it should be self-updating, right? We're never going to finally... So, if you buy this notion that the ultimate arbiter is evolution, then utility functions are subject to evolution, right? So mm -hmm. you, you, you think about it, or you can think about, should, wrong world. You, you, you can think about this, and it's useful to think about this in the following ways. To a first approximation, the number one entity that's evolving is utility functions. What you have in the world at any point is a population of utility functions, right? Yeah. And now they combine, they evolve, you have next generation of utility functions, and then and then there's also how the utility function gets optimized. That is also subject to evolution, right? And now, how the utility function is optimized changes a lot faster and is a lot more complex than the utility function itself, which is the point, right? So at a certain time horizon, it's reasonable to approximate utilities as being fixed. Like for example, the utilities that are encoded in your brain are fixed hmm. by your genes, right? Hmm. So in the context of our present you know, human moment and effective altruism or not, it makes perfect sense to think of utility as fixed, but it is evolving, and not just on, you know, eon timescales, but by, by the generation, right? You know, things evolve by the generation. Okay, but it's still relatively glacial, and I, 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 I take your point that there's a kind of divergence between the world we live in and, and the programming that we've got. But then, okay, let's imagine that we create a new population, and I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that you, you think that the utility function should emerge and, and evolve, but... I would argue for some kind of morphogenetic engineering where it's a kind of hybrid between something which is emerging but something which we can nudge. Oh, I mean, um, I'm glad you brought that up. Nudging is a form of emergence. Mm. You yourself are emergent and the things that you do are emergent as well. Everything yeah. is emergent, right? Utilities are emergent. 
Maybe the laws of physics aren't emergent. Some people would say even those are, right? Like, you know, we live in a universe with these constants because blah, 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 right? So, but to first approximation, every single thing that we've been talking about is emergent. We make a distinction between emergent and designed because that is anthropomorphic, mm -hmm. right? Is this things that we do are not emergent? Actually, no. When you nudge something that is an emergent behavior, right? We are emergent as well, right? So everything that is human, you know, so... Here's a, a very good way, I think, to think about a lot of things, which I first saw, you know, in, in Richard Dawkins, which is, although he really didn't go into this, and I wish he had, like, this notion of the extended phenotype, mm. right? Technology is our extended phenotype. Mm -hmm. So all these things that we do, right, all these things that we build, including AIs and whatnot, they are extensions of our phenotype. So if you take the long view, all of, you know, technology is, bio is the continuation of biology by another means. Mm -hmm. So when you make this distinction between emergent and non-emergent and top down and bottom up, it, it's all emergent. Interesting. Well, um, we recently did a show on, on emergence and it's a topic of interest to me personally. And uh, there's there's weak emergence and strong emergence. And there's, you know, like the view yeah. of weak emergence. So there's some you know, surprising macroscopic phenomena, maybe something which transiently emerges. And Wolfram would add in the whole, um, you know, computational irreducibility angle. And then with the strong emergence, Chalmers would say it's something which is paradigmatically surprising. It's something which is not deducible from many fundamental truths in the lower level domain. But um, I just wondered, like, how do you think about emergence? Well, I think that is a very, the distinction between weak and strong emotion is a very useful one. Right. Right. And, and I would actually phrase it in slightly different terms, which oh. is starting from physics, right? Uh, I think uh, most physicists and scientists believe in weak emergence. Well, could, right? I, could I add that Sabine Hossenfelder had a paper and she frames it with this idea of the resolution of um, physical theories. So like, like a lower resolution theory is weakly emergent from a high resolution theory. Well, exactly. And, you know, like uh, I like Sabine, but this is not her idea, right? This far predates all yeah. of us here, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and again, it's, it's a very interesting history and, and, and a very important concept. Now, so my point was that I think few people uh, have a quarrel with the notion of weak emergence in the sense that, you know, I can give you a theory of everything in the form of whatever string theory, let's take a candidate, right? Mm. But no string theory claims that that's a theory of everything in the sense that like now to study biology, psychology, sociology, you should just study string theory. No one believes that, right? Mm. There's actually interesting things to be said there, but, but let's not, let's look at, let's not go there for a second, right? There are these levels that uh, emerge weakly in the sense that they are determined by the lower levels they're just so much more complex that you're better off focusing on them in you. Now, there's this other notion, which to me is the really interesting one, which is that there is there are phenomena that are at the higher levels that are just not reducible to the lower levels. Yeah. Right? It, it, so the true emergentist, yeah. in some sense, is someone who believes the latter. And now you can ask the question, like, do you believe in that or not? Right? And I think... Um, to give the very short answer first is that ultimately there is probably no way of knowing. But pragmatically, you're actually probably better off treating the world as if it has strong emergence. And now, strong emergence is actually a very strong statement to make is to say, and by the way, going down to the lowest levels to make things very clear, you don't need to think about biology or society or consciousness or anything. Condensed matter physics, right? The particle physicists tend to believe that what they do is what everything reduces to. You talk to the condensed matter physicists, this was actually an interesting discussion that I had with Scott, you know, Aronson, because like yeah. he was very much on the, we're both computer scientists, but he was very much on the side of the particle physicists, I don't know, very much on the side of the condensed metaphysicists. What they will tell you over and over again, they see, is things that you cannot explain using quantum mechanics. Yeah. And now people say like, oh, but you can always explain things in quantum mechanics, you just haven't done the calculations. But the point is precisely that you can't do the calculations, right? The calculations are chaotic. Yeah, I have a theory. Yeah. I can come up with 500 theories of these phenomena and semiconductors and whatnot. And like, I never actually get to test them because the computations diverge before I get to test them. So for all intents and purposes, it is strong emergence. Whether truly that well, came from below is unanswerable because you can't compute the predictions. Well, we, we spoke about that. Mm -hmm. So and I, I think Keith would call that semi-strong emergence, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, whether it's computationally reachable from, from the, the lower resolution to the, to the, from the high resolution to the lower resolution. Um, but no, um, um, Sabine in her uh, paper, A Case for Strong Emergence, she was talking about singularities as being a really mm -hmm. good example of what might be strong um, uh, emergence. And uh, the philosopher Mark Bedell, um, I think, said that strong emergence is, is ridiculous. It's basically um, an affront on physicalism. 
Well, certainly, uh, you know, strong emergence and physicalism, or let's just call it reductionism. Right? Reductionism, yeah. Strong emergence and reductionism are incompatible. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and we scientists tend to be reductionists. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, now you like, and at some level, I'm both a reductionist and someone who is willing to believe in strong emergence. Again, I don't believe in strong emergence. I just don't see a way to disprove it. Right? And where the semi, and like, you know, if there's an empirical way to distinguish semi strong from strong emergence, I'd be very interested to know what it is. But now, I think the thing that is very important that a lot of people, including a lot of physicists and scientists, don't see is that we have this hypothesis that everything can be reduced to the laws of physics as we know it. Mm -hmm. We should not forget that it's just a hypothesis. And it's a hypothesis that, again, counter to what a lot of people say, is very, 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 very far from established. Mm -hmm. And usually people say like, oh, but, you know, look at all the successes of the laws of physics and blah, blah. And then I say like, you know, putting on my machine learning hat, the sample that you've used to validate the laws of physics is extraordinarily biased in the direction of simple systems. Okay. So you can't make this claim of, if the data was IID, I could say with, with great confidence, these laws apply universally, but I haven't done it. It's more like I've just landed in a new continent and I sailed up all the rivers and I say, I know what this continent looks like. You've never climbed the mountains. You've never gone in the jungle. So like this notion that the laws of physics capture everything about daily life, we just don't know how exactly. Maybe it's true, but it could also equally well be completely false. Brilliant. Well, you, you gave a bit of a hint to this earlier, actually, because you, you used the word relationism, right, which, which is basically... The, or relationalism, relationalism. which maybe should be, you know, shortened to relationism. Relationalism. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I think uh, Rosen is, is a great advocate of this, and he, he has a whole kind of um, uh, category theory calculus for, for describing uh, living uh, systems. And, and also we spoke to uh, Bob Coek, the uh, quantum um, uh, physics professor from Cambridge, and he was talking about this concept of Cartesian togetherness, which is another category or framework. But I just wondered, like, you know, does, does that inform your, your, your view? Well, relationalism, at least in one, you know, way of defining the term, very much informs my view, right? And, and one way to come at this is to say, the world is not made of independent entities. Actually, let's just start with machine learning, which is a very concrete way to look at this. A very large part, maybe even the largest part of my research in the last 20 years has been to do away with the assumption of IID data, mm -hmm. right? That the world is made of independent entities, in particular, society is made of independent agents, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, we make this assumption both as human beings, uh, you know, to some extent, and certainly very much so in science, because it makes life easier. The math is way, way, way easier when you assume independence, but it's a blatantly false assumption, right? Unfortunately, a lot of, for example, economics prominently has embedded in it this notion that the world is a bunch of independent agents, and it just doesn't work like that. And moreover, it's a distinction that is full of consequences. A society, an economy is a network of agents, and almost all the action is in their interactions. Hmm. Until you really start taking that seriously, you really don't understand the world. Again, I have no quarrel with classic economics as a first approximation. It's exactly what it should be, right? But then, and by the way, you should also not just throw it away and say like, oh, this is garbage, like some people say. You have to go the next stage, which actually now we have the mathematical and computational tools to do and understand it as being a system of interacting agents. Mm -hmm. And all of the questions that we are talking about, including, you know, in, um, you know, in evolution, even in physics, right? A, a, you know, a piece of condensed, condensed matter is a network of interacting spins, et cetera, et cetera, you name it. So the relations are at the heart of it. And moreover, like, as I said, a lot of my work is we now have the representations, the learning inference algorithms to handle things that are big piles of relations. And the whole world is better understood in those terms. And we just need people to catch up with that. You know, once you do that, you get into things that can easily be computationally intractable and so on and so forth. But there's a lot of things that we can do there and, and a lot more that we'll do. So at this level, I think relationalism is really should be a cornerstone of our understanding of the world in a way that it hasn't been in the past. Okay, and which existing, I mean, um, complexity science springs to mind, but I mean, which existing um, techniques and areas can folks look into to, to take that on board? Well, you know, uh, Markov logic, which is what I developed for this purpose, essentially, and I, and I do think, you know, you know, this is my talking about my work, so you should naturally be suspicious, but uh, I think it's the best that we have, and, and I think by a wide measure compared to anything else that we have so far. Okay, and can you sketch it out? Yeah, so uh, this, to sketch it out in the simplest terms, right, we want to combine 
all the all the traditional goodies that we had from assuming the world is IID with the power to model, you know, relationships, they are themselves potentially very complicated. The way we do it in Markov logic is there's the logical part. Mm -hmm. We actually do not solve, need to solve a new the problem of how to represent and do inference with relations. We have first order logic for that. Mm. First order logic is the language of relations. That's actually the term that is used, right? And how the relations depend, predicates, sometimes they're called predicates, but yeah. let's just call them relations, right? We have a formal language to talk about relations. And by the way, essentially all of computer science can be reduced to that. You give me your favorite, you know, whatever, knowledge representation, data structure, et cetera, et cetera. And I, can I, anybody who knows, can immediately say how to do that in logic. So that's one part. The other part is the statistical, you know, machine learning, probabilistic aspect of the world, right? And then, and again, going all the way back to physics, right? All of these things that we deal with are essentially special cases of, of what are variously called Markov networks, which is where the name Markov comes from, or graphical models, or log linear models, Gibbs distributions, Boltzmann machines, like, right? All of these things are essentially the same, right? That whole neck of the woods is captured by Markov networks, let's call them that. And Markov logic is combining Markov networks with first order logic in a single language, which you can now do everything with. Okay, okay. So just, just to like um, push back a tiny bit. So um, in the past, we've tried to create, um, let's say, things like Psyche, which is a, a knowledge representation of the world. Uh, folks like Montague have tried to do semantics using first order uh, logic to, to set some you know, varying degrees of, of success. And then we have the grounding problem we were just talking before about. Uh, you know, like even Searle said this, that, that you have kind of um, epistemic um, objectivity and subjectivity and some things are observer relative, like even economics is observer relative. So um, with this kind of formalism, how would that work? No, so very good. The problem with, or the main problem with a lot of these things that, that you mentioned, like, you know, certain types of semantics and whatnot that are based essentially on first order logic, right, is mm -hmm. that they're too brittle. Yeah. In fact, the problem with symbolic AI is that it's too brittle. Yeah. And this is exactly what Markov logic fixes. It fixes it by making it statistical. When I give you a logical statement now, I'm no longer, for example, simple logical statement, uh, you know, uh, uh, smoking causes cancer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In English, this is a valid statement. Smoking does cause cancer. Mm -hmm. But actually, once you translate it to logic for every X, smokes of X implies cancer of X, it's false because some smokers don't get cancer, mm -hmm. right? What this really was meant to be all along is a statistical statement that says smokers are more likely to get cancer. So, so the way we overcome a lot of those problems is precisely that we take all of this logic, which again, the language exists, we don't have to change it, we can, but we don't have to, and we make it statistical, as a result of which it's no longer brittle. Or at least now it's only as brittle as machine learning and graphical models and whatnot. It's not as brittle as, you know, traditional symbolic AI. Okay, and so we're speaking to a lot of GoFi people, and uh, I mean, Walid Sabah, for example, he's a rationalist, and what's interesting about the rationalists is, is they, they hate any form of uncertainty, right? right. They, they think in absolute binaries, you either know it or you no, don't. No, I mean, let me push back on that. There's this, again, you need to distinguish, you know, a general field or idea from its subtypes, right? Yeah. There is a type of rationalist that hates uncertainty, big mistake, big, mm. big mistake. Mm. There's a type of rationalist that, you know, uncertainty is what they, they you know, like, an uncertainty calculus is a type of rationalism. Yeah. And some of the best, you know, AI, philosophy, etc., is just that. So there is no incompatibility at all between rationalism and uncertainty. In fact, if if rationalism, if being rational is maximizing expected utility, notice the expected in there, mm. right? You cannot be rational if you ignore the uncertainty. Mm. Interesting. Okay, but th then um, what about the, the resolution of modeling? I mean, smoke, smoking is a really good one. So us humans, we anthropomorphize things, we, we understand the world in macroscopic terms using macroscopic ideas that, that we understand, and that kind of leads to a certain type of modeling, and that modeling presumably would be represented at that resolution, um, you know, using this formalism. Uh, well, sure, and what's the question? Well, it, it seemed, again, like I'm, I'm intuitively suspicious that we were just saying the world is a complex place, and with a lot of causal modeling, for example, a lot of the art is understanding what is relevant and what is not relevant. Mm -hmm. But what is relevant might just be kind of, you know, relevant to us. No, well, what is relevant is what is relevant relative to your utility function. Okay. Right? Again, so, it, it gets back to that precisely. The whole problem is that the world is infinitely complex and we have only finite computational resources, whether it's in our brains or our computers or whatever, right? So now what do you do, right? You are forced to oversimplify the world, not just simplify, but oversimplify, mm -hmm. right? 
but not the whole art, that's actually a good word to use, even if it's done with computers, is how do you not only simply oversimplify as little as you can, but pick out the simplifications that are least harmful to your objective. By the way, the art of the physicist, physicists would tell you, is precisely doing this, right? Physicists are very good at deciding what to simplify. And in fact, almost, I think, at some level, almost any good scientist, this is what they do, right? So, and, and now how do I decide what and how to simplify is by relevance to my utility function, right? Mm. I want to ignore parts of the world that do not affect my utility function, number one, right? And for example, the notion of conditional independence, which is the foundation of graphical models, yeah. that's what the whole idea is, is like, once I know these things, I don't have to know about those others, thank God, right? Okay, but if Ken Stanley was here, he, he, he says that the great thing about evolution is it's divergent, it's not um, convergent, it's discovering new information. And my worry is, is, is with a system like this, with, with any form of um, anthropomorphic design, would inevitably become convergent. And it might look like, um, oh, those things over there that we're ignoring don't matter, but actually they might really matter if they got introduced into the utility. Well, I wouldn't say that maximizing expected utility is anthropomorphic, hmm. right? In fact, it's one of the least, and I think maybe there's some degree of anthropomorphism is almost anything we do. And, you know, the progress of science is becoming less and less anthropomorphic and we should keep pushing on that. But I would say that maximizing expected utility is one of the least anthropomorphic things we can do. Well, this, this is actually a really interesting point because one, one of the key tenets of the rationalist movement and their conception of intelligence, because you know all of the other um, definitions of intelligence are anthropomorphic. So, you know, they're, they're based on behavior, capability, AI, a, a, a principle, um, a function is, is a big one, you know, from, from Norvig. And this, this is, this is the, the principle-based AI, which is um, just making rational uh, moves. So why, why is there such a push to be as, uh, you know, to be as, as um, uh, the least amount anthropomorphic? Oh, uh, the push is not to be, at least in my view, being le less anthropomorphic is not a goal. Hmm. That's not the goal. The goal is to be as accurate and complete as we can in modeling the world, hmm. right? Hmm. We're just trying to understand the world better, hmm. right? For whatever purpose, maybe for its own sake, maybe for the purpose of the utility and the evolution and so on, right? But that's the goal. The problem is that, and this has been the problem since day one, right? Day one of humanity, is that because we anthropomorphize the world, that gets in the way of understanding how it really works, right? Mm. If I say the wind is some god blowing, right? I understand, right? That's all they could think of, but it's a big obstacle to understanding what the wind really is. Like there's a pressure difference, mm. et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm. And we've done away with a lot of anthropomorphism. By the way, one of the problems that we're always having is that it's always pushing back, right? You know, there's always, in, you know, again, intuitively, we have a very strong tendency to anthropomorphize. So like as much as science broadly construed is a great victory, it's always in danger from this, right? But even within science, we've gone to, from doing away with the obvious forms of anthropomorphism, uh, anthropomorphism to having many things that are still there that are less obviously anthropomorphic, but still are, right? But if there's something anthropomorphic that actually is accurate, then more power to it. Interesting, yeah. And, and I guess we, we have so many cognitive priors, right, in, in, our, in our brains that give us a cone of attention which, has, which is completely anthropocentric. Well... Very good. So those priors, and maybe a better term is heuristics, right? Mm. Our brains are full of heuristics that evolution put there yeah. for a good reason, because yeah. those heuristics work, right? But they are heuristics. So they have failure modes, right? And we need to understand what it is that those heuristics really are getting at so that we also, st that, so that we use them when they're good. Mm. But then when they're not good, we use something else. Mm. Brilliant, brilliant. So Pedro, we're here at Neurips this week, and um, could you just like sketch out some of the some of the things you've seen? And I, I also know that you're a huge fan in um, uh, that there's a neurosymbolic algorithm that, that you want to tell us about. So let, let's let's hear it. So I uh, indeed I've been enjoying uh, Neurips this week. One of the big things in uh, AI in the last several years has been neurosymbolic AI, uh, which uh, you probably would not surprise by the fact that I very much believe in. So. And I believe this since I was a grad student and the whole idea of neurosymbolic AI was something that nobody was interested in, right? And now suddenly everybody is, which I think is a good development. And this is the idea that if we really want to solve AI by some definite, if we want to get to like human level intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, we need to have both uh, 
you know, like for example, uh, deep learning is not enough, right? Mm -hmm. There are symbolic reasoning capabilities that we have and that are essential. Yeah. And and we need to get them. And I think, you know, e intelligent connectionists like, I don't know, Yosho Benjo, you know, Yan Le Kuna said, they, they don't disagree with this. But 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 one way to look at this is say, we're just going to realize those, you know, capabilities using purely connectionist means, right? And what I see happening in that direction, unfortunately, is a lot of reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. So I do think, you know, symbolic AI got wedged for some reasons, including brittleness. Uh, and, you know, and we have learned from that. At the same time, they did uh, discover and understand a lot of things that are extremely relevant. So it's just not good science to ignore it. So I'm working on an approach to combine, uh, you know, symbolic AI with, uh, with deep learning. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a popular exercise these days. There are many interesting approaches out there. As much as I sympathize with them, I think they're all very far from solving the problem. They are overcomplicated and not powerful enough. Okay. So, you know, I've been working on an approach called Tensor Logic that I do believe is as simple as it can be and, and as general as it, as it can or needs to be. And, and this, you know, it, it really is a deep unification of the two things in the sense that it's not just that you combine them using, you know, a neural model that causes a symbolic one or vice versa, which is a lot of what these things that you have today do. And a lot of the claims that like, oh, this system is neurosymbolic, which it is. It's like, you know, AlphaGo is neurosymbolic because some of what it does is, is symbolic. But I'm talking about something much deeper, which is once you start doing AI, learning inference representation, intensive logic, there's just no distinction between symbolic and, and, and neural at all anymore. Can you explain that? So, so um, tensor logic, I'm, I'm just inferring from that that the, the uh, primary representational substrate is, is a continuous vector space. Is that right? Are, are you encoding discrete information into the vector space? So it's a vector space, Yeah. right? In fact, this were, the original term that we had for this was vector space logic, but yeah. then we changed it to tensor logic because it's much more appropriate. But it's, it's vector space in the abstract algebra sense of vector space, not in the traditional you know, vectors of numbers. Uh, but, but anyway... So, uh, um, as the name implies, right, tensor logic is a combination or unification of tensor algebra on the one hand and logic programming on the other. So, is it similar because uh, Bob Koek had uh, a similar idea using like tensor outer products? Is it that kind of? It's idea? related, but I think right. it goes well beyond. Okay. Right? And the basic idea is actually pretty simple, and it's just the following, right, without going into too much, you know, technical uh, detail. All of deep learning can be done using tensor algebra, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, plus univariate nonlinearities, right? So we got the tensor algebra to do that. All of symbolic AI can be done using logic programming, and moreover, it has been done using logic programming. Mm -hmm. So if you can unify these two things, this part of the job is done, right? Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, you can unify them shockingly easily, because a tensor and they so tensor algebra is operating on tensors. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, inductive logic, so logic programming, and then for learning inductive logic programming and symbolic AI, they are all operating on relations. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. what is the relationship between a tensor and the relation? Right. A relation is just a, a, an efficiently represented sparse Boolean tensor. Mm -hmm. So, at this point, we actually know that the foundation of these two things is actually the same. If your tensor is is Boolean and is very sparse, now I'm better off representing it with a relation. But at a certain level of abstraction, nothing has changed, right? So by this prism, you can look at logic programming, and logic programming is doing tensor algebra. Okay, um, just, just help me understand this a little bit. So um, you know, the main the main criticism of of using a neural network um, as a combined computational and memory substrate is that they it's a finite state automata. So without having the um, the augmented memory like a Turing machine you can't represent infinite objects. That's the main reason the symbolist, you know, that's the main argument they use. So wouldn't that argument still uh, be leveled against you? Well, no, because the, the, I'm glad you brought that up because there is a very common misconception. Okay. If you realize that there is no such thing as infinity, right? And in particular, uh, there is no such thing as an infinite, you know, memory, yeah. that problem doesn't arise. So there's the, so the, unfortunately, a lot of theorists, including computer theorists, uh, they, they foster this misconception, right? Yeah. There's the Chomsky hierarchy, right? With finite automata at the bottom and yeah. Turing complete, you know, yeah. Turing machines, blah, blah, at the top, right? Yeah. Yeah. If your Turing machine has only a finite tape, it's a finite automata. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. everything is just finite automata. Let's get that out of the way, right? A lot of what people do is like completely mistaken because of that. Now, 
the fact that everything is finite automata does not mean that everything is equally good. Some representations are far more efficient, compact, etc., etc., for certain purposes than others. And the whole game here is that, like, I'm not going to solve AI finite automata. The question is, like, what do I need to do? Not because I need to go to a higher level of Chomsky hierarchy, because in reality they don't exist. But because, you know, I mean, if you have infinite resources, you could solve AI with a lookup table. But would you, would you not, I mean, for example, um, there was this DeepMind paper that, that mapped architectures to different levels of the Chomsky hierarchy. Transformers, I, I think, were, you know, um, FSAs. Uh, RNNs actually were one step higher. They could, they could uh, represent regular languages and you've got right. context-free languages. I mean, do you, do you think there's any meaningful di distinction between those language levels? As I said, there is a meaningful distinction, but it's not the distinction that people usually make. Right. Because once you, I mean, you can debate whether the universe is finite, but certainly computers are finite. Hmm. So as far as anything that you're going to run on a computer, there truly is no distinction at this theoretical level between a Turing machine and a finite automata. Hmm. That does, so like, you, I can reduce, and people have, there are papers reducing, you know, any of these things to any of the others, right? It's like, it's a fairly trivial exercise. So at that level, those distinctions are completely meaningless. However, they are meaningful in the sense that for many purposes, I am better off having an RNN than having, you know, a transformer. And for many purposes, I'm better off. So like, let's take, you know, propositional logic versus first order logic, right? Mm -hmm. If there's no such thing as infinity, first order logic is reducible to propositional logic, but that does not mean that it's useless because it can represent a lot of things exponentially more compactly than propositional logic. If I want to represent the rules of chess in first order logic, it's a page, right? Yeah. If I want to represent them in propositional logic, it's more pages than you can have. Okay, well, I think that that's a very, very good point. But I mean, just just a devil's advocate from the psychologist. Do you know, do you remember that that Foda um, Felician Connectionism critique paper, arguing productivity and systematicity? Mm. Productivity is all about the infinite cardinality of language. I mean, presumably you would agree that language has an infinite cardinality. No, well, again, another instance of the same problem. Productivity is very important, mm. but the point to just be a little precise for a second is is to be able to generate a vast number of things beyond the ones that you started with. Vast not yep. infinite. In right. fact, mathematically, infinity is not a number. Infinity is just a shorthand for something that is so large that it doesn't matter how large it is. Okay. How, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, but surely mathematicians would push back on this because, you know, infinity is, is a, a quantity in mathematics. No, I mean, again, people in every field, mathematicians, physicists, computer scientists, are, all, are often guilty of they 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 uh, they have this notational shorthand or like you know this terminological shorthand that mm -hmm. serves them well but then they be, and then they use that and then the newer generations come along and they and the public also right they don't even realize that uh, uh what's being talked about is a little bit different infinity is a perfect example any serious mathematician will tell you that infinity does not have the properties of a number so for example mm -hmm. if i multiply infinity by 2 i still get infinity there is yeah. no number that that happens to, yeah. right? Yeah. So infinity is is not a number, right? When I say infinity is not a number, mathematicians might quibble about the way I'm stating it, but mm. this is a, this is a mathematical truth, right? Mm. Infinity truly is an out. I'm being colloquial, of course. When I say that it's a shorthand for something that is so large that it doesn't matter how large it is, when you take limits, you know, in calculus, in anything, and the limit of this blah blah as I go to infinity, this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to the point where I'm saying like. At this point, it doesn't matter how large the number is, the result will be the same. Okay. And in this way, infinitely is an extraordinarily useful concept. Yeah. So I'm not here to rail against infinity. I'm just saying like, we really need to understand. I mean, like, let me give you a very banal example, right? Um, from the point of view of, you know, what to have for lunch, right? Mm -hmm. Because some things cost more than others. Mm -hmm. um, Elon Musk is infinitely rich. He does not have infinite money. Yeah. But it makes no difference whatsoever whether he has whatever, 100 billion or 200 billion to what he's going to have for lunch. Mm -hmm. You know, like a, a, you know, a street person who has $5 to them, like their fortune is not infinite because it very much matters what lunch costs, right? So this is the real sense of infinity, which we can and should use, but we shouldn't confuse it with like, oh, but then your, your, you know, like your formalism is incomplete because it doesn't encompass infinity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It doesn't need to. Infinite doesn't exist. Okay. Okay. Well, let's come at it from from the other from from the composition, uh, you know, compositionality and and um, 
systematicity. So that's all about being able to do, you know, like their main argument was when you have a, a symbolic representation, you can kind of reuse um, the, the previous representations downstream uh, composition uh, compositionally. And when you take a discrete symbolic representation and you kind of encode it in the envelope of a vector space, you have a real problem doing that because it, it's it's now like um, it's irreversible that transformation, right? You can't go back to the uh, to the original variables. Well. It is reversible if you realize that all those real numbers are actually finite, right? Okay. So notice that real number, there's nothing less real than a real number. Real numbers are imaginary, hmm. right? Real numbers are numbers with infinite precision, which is a monstrosity. And many people have said this, including mathematicians and physicists, right? The notion of an infinite, of a number with an infinite number of digits is just monstrous. And again, in particular on a computer, even if you use, you know, uh, 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 you know, like, numbers with unlimited floating point precision, right? It's limited by the size of your memory. Hmm. So this transfer from, which is actually very important, and again, that's what tensor logic largely is about, from purely symbolic structures to embeddings yeah. in a vector space, right? Yeah. That vector space is still finite. So there's actually nothing irreversible about what happened there. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So how can people, um, you know, find out more information about this? And can you just sketch out, you know, just 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 to bring it home to people wh where they could actually use it and how, how it would be, you know, better than what they can currently do? Right. The answer to the first question, unfortunately, is that this is not published yet, but, but uh, hopefully okay. it will be soon. Okay. So for yeah. the moment, uh, there is no very good place to point people to. Okay. Uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but but that that hopefully will be fixed soon. Uh, the the um, the question of where to apply it is our goal for this is that this should become the language, or hope I should say our hope mm. is that this will become the language for doing just about anything in AI. So yeah. for example, if what you want to do is actually nothing symbolic, but you just want to build a convnet, mm. you can express a convnet incredibly elegantly in tensor logic. Yeah. Like if you think of, for example, TensorFlow or PyTorch versus NumPy, right? They, they allow that thing to be said much more compactly. Compared to TensorLogic, they are as bad as NumPy is compared to them, mm. right? Same thing on the symbolic side. But of course, the real action comes in all the problems where you have both components. Mm -hmm. The problem with all those problems, which ultimately is every problem in AI, right? You're always like, what happens today that is very frustrating and that's what we're trying to overcome is like, you start from one of these sides, these days mainly the connectionist one, which you have a good mastery of. And then the other side, for example, the symbolic one, the knowledge representation, the reasoning, the yep. composability, you just hack. Yeah. And your hack solution is terrible. You're like, you're reinventing the wheel, you're making it square, you're trying to make it turn, but it's square, right? It's just, you know, it's a disaster. And with TensorLogic, you can actually have a very well-founded, very well-understood basis on either side. Mm -hmm. So now you don't have to hack either side. Now, there's, of course, still things that you're going to have to hack at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, you know, AI is intractable and things are heuristic. But this, you know, is, you know, you know this notion of a trade-off that is very important in engineering, right? Like, people have been exploring different points on this trade-off curve. The point of, 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 of uh, uh, TensorLogic is that whatever your application is, we move, we're moving you to a better trade-off curve. Hmm. It's still a trade-off curve, but, but it dominates the old one. For any given X, you have a better Y and vice versa. Okay, and, and just help me understand, because we'll, we'll move over to, um, you know, the discrete program search and some of Josh Tannenbaum's work in, mm. in a moment. But um, there are two schools of thought, right? There, there's discrete first and there's continuous first. You're, you're, con you're on the continuous substrate. But usually the reason for the continuous um, substrate is stochastic gradient descent, learnability, et cetera, et cetera. And like, help me understand. So are you saying we start with a symbolic representation and then we encode it into the envelope? So wh where does learning come into it? No, very good. So in tensor logic, you can do, broadly speaking, two kinds of learning. You can learn the structure of these tensor equations, as we call them, right. using inductive logic programming techniques. Again, right. yeah. that whole technology is yeah. there. Yeah. And then once you have that, you can learn the numbers by, by uh, backprop, in particular what is called backpropagation through structure, because the structure can vary from example to example, but we know what the type parameters are. So all of the machinery of inductive logic programming and all the machinery of gradient descent and deep learning or not, they're both there, available to be used as you traditionally have. Okay. What if I made the argument though that it's almost like the inductive um, logic, you know, like the, the the program search. That's the hard bit. So if you've already got the program, why do I then need to put it into a vector space? No, actually, these are all. So at the end of the day, in machine learning, we're always trying to learn a program of some kind, yeah. right? The question is like, what is the easiest way to do that? And precisely the problem with ILP as with symbolic logic is and that's really a couple of problems. One is that if all that you do, you learn programs that are too brittle, mm. and we don't want them to be brittle, right? And the other one is that. 
each type of search has, it li has its limitations. So in particular, in symbolic AI, including ILP, we tend to use a lot of combinatorial optimization types of search. Right? What we in AI call search is discrete search. Yeah. And that is good in some ways, but also very limited in others. The same thing is true of gradient descent. Right? Mm -hmm. And now to go to that for just a second, gradient descent is not a continuous optimization algorithm. It's not, right? Gradient, again, those rule numbers are not infinite precision. There's actually nothing continuous going on in the computer. Gradient descent truly, literally, rigorously, mathematically is a discrete optimization algorithm. It takes discrete steps. The assumption that gradient descent depends on, which is that the, the, the infinitesimally small updates do not hold. And moreover, in machine learning, as in numerical analysis, we are constantly dealing with this fact that there's a mismatch between our mathematical conceptual model of the space that we're working with as continuous with the reality of the computer that is not continuous. So, okay. gradient, so now, this is not, but gradient descent still is a different optimization technique with some very important advantages, in particular the key, right, the power of gradient descent comes from the fact that to move from my current point to a better one, I don't need to try out all the neighboring points because that takes order of the time of the neighboring points. I have a closed form way to compute what is the best one, yeah. right? And then I move there. And this is absolutely brilliant, right? Like we don't want to let go of that, right? This is, you know, Newton's and Leibniz's bright idea, right? The price of that is that in order to do that, you have to make this approximation, which again, calculus is an approximation. It assumes that certain effects are second order and can be ignored. Now, ironically, when you learn a large deep network these days, you're actually in a regime where they cannot be ignored, right? Because these infinitesimal changes are not that infinitesimal because you take a finite step, right? The gradient descent is always taking finite steps, which is why it's a discrete algorithm. And, and once you take that finite step for any reasonable learning rate, the total effect of the approximations that you've made typically swamps the step that you're taking. So the assumption of calculus that gradient descent is founded on is actually false. Now, in some ways, this invalidates a lot of our intuitions. In many ways, and again, this remains to be resolved, a lot of why gradient descent works better than people expect it to is in fact that it's doing something else. It's doing stochastic search, partly because of the SGD as opposed to being batched, partly because of things like this. Okay, well, th this is really interesting. A couple of places we can go, but first of all, I, I remember you, you, you did the, the paper and that, that um, introduced elements of um, NTK theory as well, which might be an argument against the, the discreteness of, of the optimization. But also, I wanted to trade off the, the two types Wait, of Why is there an argument against the discreteness? Well, isn't there a, with NTK, isn't there like a closed form solution? Doesn't that kind of like erode the discreteness of the optimization? No, I mean, so there's several things here, but like, if you have a closed form solution, absolutely brilliantly go for it. Yeah. Right? There's nothing having a closed form solution in no way implies that it's continuous or discrete or any other thing. Right? Oh, it doesn't so so be, let, let's say there was a closed form solution and, and and it was like an infinite kernel and it represented some neural network. Doesn't that erode no, the argument? Well, that well, it's so, a so first problem? okay, so first of all, in the work that I so the work that I've done that I think you're referring to is like I have a proof that every model learned by gradient descent is a kernel machine. Yeah. Right? And it's something called the path kernel, which is the integral of the of the neural tangent kernel, you know, over the over gradient descent, right? Yeah. And now the neural tangent kernel uh, does not assume that your network is infinite. Most of the theory that people have done with it assumes that the network is infinitely wide. But my but but the the, the definition absolutely does not require that. And none of what I do, and in fact, that's part of why you know of its power is that it assumes no infinity of anything. It's for any architecture that you use. And in particular, you know, finite architectures. Okay, in interesting. Okay, so hen hence the discreteness. But right. can we come back to this contrasting of the discrete program search and and the you know stochastic gradient descent on on, on a vector space? Now, um, in the vector space, uh, there are certain characteristics. You know, there are certain symmetries. And even though it's a discrete search through the space, I would argue that it's still continuous in nature. It has certain characteristics. So contrast those those two forms of no, optimization. Precisely so, uh, exactly. I, I, I mean, I think you've put your finger in it now. The whole point of these continuous spaces, right, is not that they're continuous, because again, that's, that's a fiction, is that they have a certain locality structure yeah. that you can exploit to very good effect. And this is exactly what gradient descent does, right? Now, that locality structure doesn't have to be infinitesimal, right? You don't need points to be infinitely close for all this to apply approximately. And again, they never are, and it's always an approximation. Now, the question is, do you want to make these locality assumptions or not, right? Making them buys you certain things, right? 
but it's also potentially unrealistic in some ways, right? Now, mm. this actually, to take a very concrete instance of this, think of space, right? We model space in, in science, in physics, in, in anything, as a continuous thing, which it is not, right? Which is not to say that, and by the way, physicists are coming to this conclusion, right? These days, the prevailing view is, is the it from bit thing, is that like, yeah. it's, you know, space arises from entanglement, et cetera, et cetera, like, space is not the fundamental reality, right? Mm. And now, I think that where this is inevitably going one way or another is that we realize that space is discrete, right? But, and this is key, it has certain properties, including symmetries like translations, invariance, rotation invariance, et cetera, et cetera, that hold approximately or exactly. But if those hold and, and a, whole, a whole bunch of things like that, then you have, you know, your latent variable structure, right? is very well approximated by our notion of continuous space, mm -hmm. in which case it would be foolish to not use it, mm -hmm. right? To formulate the laws of physics and to do computer vision and so on and so forth. But at the same time, right, if we believe in it too literally, we walk ourselves into a blind alley. So concretely, look at computer vision, right? People in the early days of computer vision started out trying to do it with differential equations and Fourier analysis and all of that good continuous stuff, right? Because that was the obvious thing to do, right? and it failed. That doesn't work. That's why we need things like deep learning and, you know, Markov random fields that are discrete grids that use, you know, to model the images and whatnot. Because you are, along with the approximate continuity, you also often have large discontinuities. Mm. And if you can only model the world continuously, then you, can't, you don't know what to do. And the problem precisely is that you have all these phenomena that are like this, including, you know, in vision, but also in, in turbulence and condensed metaphysics and so on. You've got to realize that there are discontinuities and not try to shoehorn them into continuity when that's no longer appropriate. Interesting. Okay. Well, can, can we bring in um, ILP and can you contrast like the, the kind of function spaces that, that are uh, learnable in, in both methods? Yeah. So ILP, so let, let me actually preface this with the following. People in every one of these schools of AI tend to have this view that I can represent everything in the world using my approach. So I can, like, look, Prolog is Turing complete, so why do you need neural networks? Yeah. But I can also say, neural networks are Turing complete, so why do I need Prolog? And in fact, kernel machines have a representative theorem that says you can approximate any function, blah, 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 right? So yeah. everybody has one of these representer theorems, right, that says I can represent anything, right? So in particular, you can do, right, I mean, look, First order logic was invented by, by Frege, essentially, to, to model the real numbers. So it can almost by definition model real numbers, right? Yeah. Anything you might want to say about real numbers and, and gradient descent and you'll networks, and in fact, people have even done this exercise, you can say it all in, in, in logic programming, right? So why not just do that? Well, precisely because certain things are much more easily done in other ways, right? So what you have to ask about anything, but then about, you know, in that the logic program in particular, like, what things are well represented in this way, like compactly represented, and then in such a way that learning them and doing inference with them is easy, mm. right? And those things are different for logic programming and for things like deep learning, which is why we need a unification of both. So what is things like logic programming and ILP good for, right? It's precisely, I mean, it's many things, but the key thing is it's precisely for learning pieces of knowledge that can then be reused and composed in arbitrary ways. This is the huge power of symbolic AI that connectionism does not have, right? It's like, I learn a fact here, I learn a rule there, and tomorrow you ask me a question, and I combine that fact, actually several rules by rule chaining, right? There's a whole proof yeah. tree of rules that could have come from very different places, and I do a completely novel chain of inference that answers your question. This is spectacular, right? And this is surely core to what intelligence is all about. Mm -hmm. And the symbolists know how to do it. The connectionists don't, but if I was a connectionist, I'd be like, you know, and if it was a good one, and the better ones like Yoshio Benjim are doing this, right? It's like, go and try and understand what those people understand so that you can then now combine it with those other ideas. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. So a huge part of intelligence is this um, symbolic, uh, you know, extrapolation. Yeah, right. so um, how, how do you um, bring abstraction into this? Because I, I, the, the thing that I always get caught on is that the traditional go fi vision was to you know handcraft the knowledge and actually what we need is dynamic knowledge acquisition and we need the ability to create abstractions on the fly rather than just what we do now which is crystallizing existing human abstraction how could we do that bit well abstraction traditionally was and still is a central topic in in, in symbolic ai hmm. right like be precise i mean 
I think nobody questions that having levels of abstraction someone is very important. The only question is how. Yeah. So if you look at classic knowledge representation, planning, et cetera, et cetera, abstraction is all over the place. If you look at things like reinforcement learning and, I mean, even like, you know, the whole idea or hope of a convert is that it captures objects at multiple levels of abstraction, at least in, to some degree. In reality, it doesn't, right? But that's what people are trying to do and, and not quite doing, right? Well, good. Let, let, let's let's touch on that then. So, um, I mean, certainly in, in Jan Lacoon's view, I, I spoke with Jan the other day, he's got this um, autonomous path uh, paper. And, he, you know, his system is learning abstractions, but they're abstractions which are deducible from base abstraction priors, like objectness and, and you know, basic visual priors. And so there's, there's, there's this assumption that everything is deducible from the priors that we put into the model. But um, I have this kind of intuition that abstraction space is much larger than that. Yeah, I mean, so... I would even say that if if you arrive at your abstraction solely by deduction, you have a very impoverished notion of abstraction. Hmm. In fact, most of inductive learning is forming abstractions. And forming abstractions at the most basic level is something very trivial. Is like, I have an example described by a thousand attributes. If from that I induce a rule that uses only 10, I've abstracted away the other 990. Okay. Right? But but if if um if a symbolist was here, they would talk about intention versus extension, and they would say that you know you're selecting from this infinite set of possible attributes. You couldn't possibly represent all of the attributes in this. I mean, just to give you a concrete example, you know, you you could have um a a a a a a a a. a you know, do you know what I mean? You, you mm -hmm. just have like this and again. Like I, I hate to bring up infinity again mm -hmm. because that that's always what these folks bring up. But um, how could you select from from a set that large? Well, I don't need to because it is finite. Yeah. But what I need to do is so so. But there is actually a good example, and we, you know, infinity does did not bother us at all at all there because what's like if my training set right is a set of strings, mm. and those strings are a a a a a a right going up to whatever number you want to pick, like you know a million or a quadrillion, you know, or a Google right, then are is your learning algorithm able to induce that the the language that these rules come out of right the grammar is you know it's a series of a's right you and I can do that immediately. You know, most deep networks have no end of trouble doing that, even though it's that basic. So yeah. it is a very good example of what symbolic learning and reasoning can do versus connectionist. You don't need to go anywhere near infinity to actually have that be a very elegant example. Well, let me bring up just one other. We've touched on a lot of great things, right? There's one in this space of things that we've been talking about. There's one that I think is very important, which I believe you're also a fan of, and I very much am. And I think it's going to, you know, maybe going back to the question of what I'm interested in that's happening at, at NeurIPS right now or not. So neurosymbolic AI is definitely a big one. Yeah. Uh, another big one, and to my mind, maybe these are the two biggest ones or most interesting, is, is um, what I call symmetry-based learning. And yeah. these days is, is more popularly known by the, by, the, by the name of like geometric deep learning and things yeah. like that. I tend to view geometric deep learning as a special case of symmetry-based learning. Yeah. But this idea of... Uh, I think, let me, you know, to go straight to the punchline, we know that, for example, AI and machine, machine learning in particular have as foundations things like, you know, logic, probability optimization. And I think another foundation is symmetry group theory. Yep. In fact, I was having, you know, dinner with, with Max Welling just the other day, who, who of course, you've also interviewed oh. and is, you know, like a great, you know, person in, in this area. And we, you know, I think we have very similar views on this. Well, well, Pedro, yesterday, um, Taco Cohen was sitting where you were sitting. <laughs> so there you go, yeah. yeah. Again, I remember talking with Taco at some ICML many years ago where he had published one of the first papers on this. Yeah. And I was like, and he seemed a little disheartened by the lack of interest that people had. Mm. And I said to him, just wait, this is going to be big and we're there now, right? And yeah. it's going to be even bigger, I think. But also, I think to become bigger, and again, to jump straight to the punchline, most of the work, including me, that people have done to date has been exploiting known symmetries, like, you know, translation invariance is the quintessential example. For example, we have something called deep affine networks that generalize conrads to, you know, a, you know, rotation, you know, scaling, et cetera, et cetera. This is all well and good. But I think if this is, and, and if you look at NeurIPS today, for example, most is in that vein. Yeah. And there's a lot of good work to be done there, but if that's all we ever do, we will always remain a niche mm -hmm. in AI. With certain very good applications like science applications where we know that certain symmetries hold and whatnot, Max and Taco are doing things like that. Mm. But I don't want to just do that. I really, you know, I'm trying to make progress towards human level AI. And I think the key there is to discover symmetries from data. Yeah. Right? And I think most of us agree with this. It's a hard problem, right? Mm -hmm. But that's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. We want to discover symmetries from data. 
And, you know, there's an interesting, you know, discussion of how to do that. You know, I have a number of ideas and, and a number of people have. Then the power of discovering symmetries, right, connecting back to our earlier conversation, is that symmetries can, individual symmetries can be very easy to discover because they're often very simple. But then, right, by the group axioms, axioms you can compose them arbitrarily. Yeah. Which means I can, for example, by learning 100 different symmetries of a cat from 100 different examples, then I can compose them and correctly recognize as a cat something that is extremely different from any concrete example of a cat that I saw before. Could, could I push back on that a tiny bit? So, I mean, in the, the Geometric Deep Learning Proto book, I mean, they, they, they spoke about, um, you know, the various symmetries of groups like SO3, you know, preserves um, translations and, and angles. Um, you know, like how primitive and how platonic are these symmetries? And aren't, aren't they just like obvious in respect of the domain that, that you're in? No, very good. So uh, this is actually a key question. Symmetry group theory is one of them. It's a central area in mathematics today, and it's very highly developed, and it's the foundation of modern physics. Like, the standard model is a bunch of symmetries and so on. But the way, and there is an exhaustive listing of what all the possible symmetry groups are. Yeah. Discrete ones, you know, uh, 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 continuous ones, you know, so-called Lie groups, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So at, at that level, this is not naive because people already have a handle on what the space is, right? But crucially for our purposes, for AI, that's not enough. Because, precisely because those, again, the analogy with logic is, 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 is actually a very good one here. First order logic is too brittle, right? And, and plain symmetry group theory, the way people have mostly applied so far, is also too brittle for the same reason. So, for example, right, something that, you know, people almost always immediately come up with, say, like, oh, I understand, you know, well, like, symmetries would allow you to recognize, you know, perturbed digits, but a six is not a nine. Mm. So, some, mm. right? If you just take naive symmetry group theory and you say like, well, arbitrary composability, as I was just talking about, it's like, well, now you've just said that a six, you've lost the ability to distinguish a six from a nine, yeah. right? Now, what we need precisely is to combine symmetry group theory with the other things like statistics and optimization and say something like the following. The space of things that you can compose is unlimited. You can have, you know, unlimited compositions, but for example, you pay a cost for composing more symmetries. And now when you find the least cost path, and that's how you're going to match things, or, you know, your digit becomes less and less probable to be in six, the more you've rotated it, right? So now we know how to do all of that very well. So we know symmetry group theory very well. We know how to do all these probabilistic cost minimizing, blah, 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 things in machine learning very well. We just need to combine the two the same way that we have previously combined these things with first order logic. So I'm, I'm glad you brought in the cost. That that was really, really good. So um, it, it, there are trade-offs everywhere. I mean, for example, if you want to make the models more fair and, uh, you know, prioritize the, the low frequency attributes on the long tail, the headline accuracy goes down. Same thing with robustness. If you robustify a model, the headline accuracy goes down. Same thing with symmetry groups. If you introduce other symmetry groups, you know, that the headline accuracy um, goes down. So uh, it all comes back to the bias variance trade-off at the end of the day. And, you know, where is the limit here? Like, how, how, how much can we optimize these models and, and what does good look like? The bias variance trade-off is a very useful tool, right? But, but it's not the deepest reality, right? The, the, the way to think about bias variance is that, what again, talking about this notion of a trade-off curve, there's a trade-off between bias and variance, right? Which is in some sense unavoidable, mm. right? In machine learning, if you have finite data, you're trying to learn powerful models, bias variance is a trade-off. And it's a very consequential trade-off in the sense that, for example, the things that work best with small amounts of data tend not to work best with large amounts of data, right? Mm. This is something that we should all, you know, grow up knowing in machine learning, but so many mistakes have been done because of that, because people study things in the easy, or historically that's all they had, right? And then they're very surprised when something that seemed not very good, like say deep learning, right, turns out to be better when you have a large amount of data. Or they believe in like silly things like, you know, Occam's razor version that, you know, accurate, you know, simple is more accurate and whatnot. So a lot of mistakes have been, been made because of lack of understanding of this. Having said that, what you really want is to move to a better trade-off curve between bias and variance, which you can if you get at what the reality is, right? So the real game in machine, once you're evaluating your learner and figuring out, you know, like how much to prune and whatnot, or, or how much to regularize, bias variance is very important. But before that, the most important question is like, what we're trying to do here is figure out what are the inductive biases, what are the regularities that the world really has, at least approximately, mm -hmm. that we build our algorithms on top of that. And then if you give me a better one than I have now, 
I'll still have a bias variance trade off, but I'll be in a, in a curve where for the same variance, I can have less bias and vice versa. And that's where the real action is. Oh, interesting. Well, I didn't quite understand that because, you know, bias and variance, it, they are mutually exclusive. And I, I thought at first you were saying, well, if we understand what the biases are better, you know, the, the prototypical symmetries of the world we live in, then, then, then we can have more bias without having no, yeah. an approximation error, basically. The confusion arises because bias is a very, unfortunately, overloaded term. This is not even getting into the psychological notion of bias like in, you know, Danny Kahneman's work or even the sociological notion of bias like racial biases, gender biases and whatnot. So we need to distinguish. So like I just used, you know, my bad, the word bias in two completely different senses, completely but not unrelated. That's the thing, right? One of them is the statistical notion of bias, hmm. right? That, you know, there, there really is a trade off between the two, right? There's a sum of squares, blah, 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 right? The machine learning notion of inductive bias, it's the preference that you have for certain models over others, which is really just another way of saying your priors, hmm. whether they are assumptions or knowledge, right? You know, maybe I should have said in, in, instead of bias, say like, what you really want to do is figure out what are the priors, what are the model classes, what are the preferences, right? A bias is a kind of preference that really line up with the world in reality or the domain and therefore let you move to a better trade-off curve among statistical bias and statistical variance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, um, Pedro, um, just tell us a little bit about uh, what, what, what have you seen at Neurips and, and how's the week been for you? So uh, we've already touched on the, some of the interesting things that I saw, uh, um, in particular some of the areas that, that I'm interested in. The thing about Neurips these days, of course, is that it's a vast conference. Mm. And in the early days, I used to at least go through the proceedings and, and, and look at you know, the title and maybe the abstract of every paper. And this is now impossible, right? Yeah. Now, these days, if all you do is try to walk through the poster sessions, you never get to the end, right? Yeah. I haven't been to a single poster session in, in this Neurips where I actually, you know, actually got through all. I like to go through the poster sessions quickly once yeah. and then, you know, just to see what's there and then go back to the ones that I found really interesting. I haven't actually been able to even finish that walkthrough. Uh, because they're so vast, right? You also run into people, which is part of the point, and talk and whatnot. But like, when there's 500, you know, posters in every session and there's 3,000 papers in the conference, it becomes very hard to find the ones that are most relevant. Of course, an easy thing to do is look at the, you know, what the, I mean, something about Neurips this year that I honestly thought was absolutely terrible, like a really, really terrible idea, is that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a hybrid conference. And, you know, their idea of a hybrid conference is that there are no talks. The yeah. talks are all virtual next week, and, and NIPS, is a, NIPS this year, you know, to a first approximation was one big poster session, mm. which I mean, it, mm. to me, this is just an incredibly bad idea. Yeah. So in that sense, I haven't gotten as much out of NIPS by this point of the conference as I would have in most years, right? There's also looking at the papers that were usually selected as oral, but this time they call them oral equivalent because there are no oral papers, but they still want to have that distinction. And, and, you know, the number of, of those papers these days is 160 or something, which is, you know, bigger than NIPS and ICML were, uh, at, you know, some years ago. And usually from those papers, some of them kind of like jump out at you as being great and very relevant. I've only looked at them briefly, right? So, uh, you know, don't, don't you know, um, quote me on this, if you will. But none of those have jumped out to me, uh, uh, you know, as like, oh yeah, this sounds like something really brilliant and, and, and that I want to dig into. But there probably are many, I just haven't, you know, really had the chance to look at them yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a similar reaction. I mean, it, it, it feels like um, that we're at the point of saturation and there are loads and loads of microvariant uh, variations on, on the same idea. It's completely overwhelming. But what I find is that it's, it's a very social experience. When I walk through the posters, I just immediately become engrossed in conversation and yeah. hours go by and I just think, oh my God, what have I just been doing for the last... And that, that's the real point is the posters are very good, you know, uh, it, you know, it's like the grain of sand and the oyster. The poster is the grain of sand. The oyster is the conversation that you have with yeah. the person at the poster or with, or, or with other people around there. To touch on another point that you made that I think is actually important. So, you know, Neurips and ICML and so on are, are bigger today than they've ever been, right? Mm -hmm. Actually... Not strictly too, because this recent NIPS, surprisingly, the attendance has gone down a lot. You can, you know, yeah. we can ask, we can ask, we can and should ask why. But we need to scale. We, you know, like there are bigger conferences, like the Neuroscience Conference is one conference and it's 35,000 people, you know, every year and they make it work. I don't think, and it's good to experiment. I, I think, you know, NIRIPS at the scale that it is today can work, but it is not working very well. One of the ways in which it's not working very well is that 
we need to think a lot more. And I understand this is work and it's hard and people have day jobs and whatnot. So this is not, you know, a, a criticism in that sense. But like, we need to really work on making it easy for people to find the papers that are relevant to them. Mm -hmm. Right, number one. Number two, and maybe even more important, there is more machine learning research today than ever. But in some sense, the diversity of the, that research is in some ways lower than ever. So another point that you brought up, and I think is very important to do with the scaling of, of NeurIPS and, and the machine learning community is that we have, in just raw numbers, more machine learning and AI research going on today than ever before by an order of magnitude. But in terms of diversity, there's probably less diversity in the research now than there was before, which is a tragedy, right? So I understand why people have kind of like converged to deep learning. And, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of deep learning, right? I was doing it before it was cool as they say and whatnot. But the extent to which like 90% of the community, not just in machine learning, but, AI, but AI is not just pursuing and not even deep learning, but a, a special type of deep learning, which is which you might call applications of backprop, hmm. is extremely um, undesirable, right? We have, you know, an infinite number of micro improvement papers along a particular direction that is almost certainly a local optimum, right? And we're just digging into that local optimum with ever more papers and ever, you know, more, you know, minimal publishable units when this large amount of manpower that has come into the field or, or you know, or is moving around, we really need to have a greater diversity of research in machine learning, within deep learning, within AI. And, 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 and you know, so like we are making very poor use of our research, you know, manpower right now. And we see that very much at NeurIPS today. Yeah, I mean, Sarah Hooker talked about the hardware lottery, you know, being stuck in a basin of attraction determined by hardware, but there's also an idea lottery. It might just be the case that NeurIPS historically has always been very connectionist anyway. I mean, uh, maybe well, well, it hasn't, right? That's one of the ironies, but it's- Oh, okay, is, I wasn't well, aware of that, okay. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, in fact, the joke is, right, that uh, uh, NIPS started in the 80s. It was called Neural Information Processing Systems. Right. And by the 90s, it should have become uh, BIPs for Bayesian Information Processing Systems, ah, right? right? There was this study that they did at one point of predictors of acceptance and rejection among words in the title. And the biggest predictor of rejection was the word neural. Really? And this was very famous in the field because, indeed, if circa, you know, 1990-something, you were submitting papers to NIPS with the word neural in the title, you didn't know what you were doing. And then in the, in the 2000s, right, it became BIPs, or should have become BIPs, sorry, KIPs, yeah. Kernel Information Processing Systems. Yeah. And in fact, I remember having lunch with Yosho Binger at the ICML in Montreal in 2009, and, and we were talking about this, right, the fact that every decade, and, you know, not a new paradigm, but another one of the same paradigm seems to now be on top, right? And, you know, you know he asked, like, so what is the next decade going to be? And I said, it's going to be DIPs, Deep Information Processing Systems. And then we both laughed. <laughs> And I could tell that I believe this, but he, Yashua Benji, was actually skeptical of this. So, you know, the, the, the deep, and little did we know, right? If somebody told us that, you know, this is going to be on the page of the, on the front page of the New York Times in a couple of years, we'd be like, what are you smoking, right? <laughs> so the way to which this decade has been dips is just mind blowing. But looking forward, right? And to this point of, you know, diversity in research approaches, I think if you extrapolate naively from the past, the next decade will be about something else. And the yeah. trillion dollar question is, what, what is that else going to be? Amazing. Okay. Um, you watched Chalmers talk, right? Yeah. What's your high level view? I thought it was a nice talk. I thought it was a very appropriate talk for an opening talk at the conference. It, actually, if NeurIPS had like some conferences, a dinner talk, right? Which is supposed to be interesting, but not as you know, deep or as technical as others. This would have been the perfect dinner talk for NeurIPS. Because the topic is very current, right? Our machines sentient. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, who better to talk about it than Dave Chalmers, right? The world's expert on, 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 on consciousness, right? And, and, and by and large, uh, I thought the talk was excellent. In fact, you know, when journalists ask me questions, you know, consciousness is like one of their top three, right? Mm -hmm. Along with Terminator and, you know, unfairness or something like that, right? And, and I will point them to this talk because it kind of like lays out, you know, the... Uh, you know, the ground, uh, 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 and, you know, it's good for people to at least have that, those things in mind. At the end of the day, so I think, of course, the notion that Lambda was sentient is, you know, ridiculous, as, as most of us do. Uh, you could ask a slightly more fine-grained question was if, it, if, if, if consciousness is on a continuum, right, which I think Dave believes in, and if you believe in like this, you know, IT theory and phi and whatnot, you know, like, Phi is never zero, right? So there's always some consciousness, right? 
panpsychism and whatnot. I'm not saying I believe in that. We could we could go into it, but like if you believe in that, then you can ask. Well, on that scale, you know, where is lambda? Yeah. Where are these large language models? And 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 surely higher than previous AI systems, right? But in my view, still very 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 far. And I think what you want to keep in mind is that consciousness does not does not increase continuously. Precisely, there's these transitions where you go. You know, more is different is the is the famous you know phrase about emergence, right? Consciousness is very much an emergent you know phenomenon, and I think what happens is that there are points at which your consciousness will leap. Maybe a thermostat does have consciousness, like mm-hmm. you know, uh, or or you know, or purpose or whatever, right? Like like people in, in like people like McCarthy, for example, had 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 that as an example. But the amount of consciousness is minuscule, and and that and and the way I would put that is that these large language models still have not passed that first threshold. Interesting. So, so in a similar way to some of the discussion about large language models, there are kind of scaling uh, breaks in the levels of consciousness. I mean, Chalmers made the comment, though, that rather than it being a, a pure continuum, he said that a bottle was not conscious, but then there was a kind of... No, yes. So, yeah. very key point. Scaling is part of it, but not only. Mm. It's not just... A, so, your cortex to a first approximation is a monkey brain scaled up, Right? There was a module there that evolution discovered, and it really paid to keep making more and more of it. And we can easily speculate why. But the point is, so let me contrast two things, right? Which is true for for consciousness, but also for just AI in general. Right? There, a lot of people are scaling believers, and like OpenAI is the poster child of this in a quite conscious way. It's like we're just going to scale the heck out of things. Hmm. And then a lot of people, like you know Gary Marcus, being a good example, they just completely poo-poo that. They say like, oh no, this is a joke, right? And I think the truth is that. Scaling is good, right? Again, you know, part of what we are, our intelligence is scaling. But, but, but the question is, what are you scaling? And the things that we're scaling today, it doesn't matter how much we scale them, hmm. we never get to human level intelligence or consciousness. So I think we need some fundamentally different algorithms, if you want to think at, at the level of algorithms, or fundamentally different architect, architectures, if you want to think about it in a way. And then scaling those up, at some point will give us consciousness if you believe that it's possible for a computer to be conscious. But we're not there yet, either in terms of the scaling, although actually scaling is actually the easier part of this way. We're actually at the point where a computer can have the same amount of computing power that, a, that, that your brain does, which was not the case before. But the bigger, deeper problem, and the more fundamental one is like, we need the architecture to scale, right? Mm. And this is where I sympathize, you know, with people like Jeff Hinton, who's just, you know, uh, playing with you know ideas using mathematics and very small examples, which in some ways sounds very underpowered, but it, I think it's people like that that are going to come up with the things that we then scale. As in fact, it was David Rodmerhart doing that kind of work that invented backprop. Hmm. Right? Hmm. If he hadn't invented backprop, this whole industry would not exist. So, what I think is that the real backprop, the real master algorithm, is not there yet, and we need to discover that first, and then. We, and then when we scale that up, which will not be trivial, but will be much easier by comparison, then we'll have, you know, human level, intelligence, consciousness, etc. Interesting. Okay. And um, so Chalmers is a, um, a structuralist computationalist. So, you know, he, he thinks information, not biology. And um, he's also uh, um, a functionalist, right? So, you know, which, which is very similar to, um, to, to behavior. And, uh, you know, Hilary Putnam made the move that you can kind of like represent a computation in any open physical system. And he kind of like used that. On, you know, if you, if you follow that line of thought, it almost trivializes computationalism because, you know, it leads to panpsychism uh, very, very quickly. So, so first of all, I mean, what, what's your take on this idea that information could give rise to intelligence and consciousness? So I agree, like most scientists, and I think in particular most computer scientists, that to a first approximation, the substrate does not matter. And in particular, you're not going to convince me that something is not conscious just because it's not biological. Hmm. There is no reason to think that only biological things can have consciousness. Now, the deeper problem, and you know, indeed the hard problem, is that, so as Dave Chalmers defined it, conscious, so there's a basic fork here which you've alluded to, which is if consciousness is subjective experience, hmm. then all these questions about consciousness are ultimately unresolvable because only I have my subjective experience. I know that I'm conscious. No one can persuade me of the contrary. I don't even know if you are conscious, let alone some machine, right? 
So if, if consciousness is an intrinsic property of something that cannot be evaluated from the outside, then we're doomed. We're never going to answer this question. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is the case, right? So I'm not saying that's false, and you need to always keep that in mind. But now, if we're going to make any kind of progress, right, we need to look at what are, to, to generalize a well-known term, the external correlates of consciousness, right? One of those which has been well studied by people like Christoph Koch and, and so on, and I think that's a very good direction, is the neural correlates of consciousness, right? Yeah. What goes on in your brain that correlates with consciousness? And we've made a lot of progress with that. You can also talk about what are sort of like the informational, computational correlates of consciousness. Mm. Are there computational structures that support consciousness and the ones that don't? I think that is also a useful thing to do. Less developed, it actually enters this panpsychism because it's not like everything is conscious just because it can compute. Hmm. Some computations after this emergence and these, you know, phase transitions may give rise to consciousness, whereas others, it doesn't matter how much of them you have, they will never be conscious. So I think this is also a very useful way to make progress on this question and one to which AI versus, you know, uh, uh, neuroscience or psychology is very well suited to. Interesting. So on, on the functionalism point, um, uh, I think Chalmers has been very, very consistent. He uses this uh, kind of calculi to reason about intelligence as well. So a system is intelligent if it can perform reasoning, if it can perform planning, if it has sensing and so yeah. on. So we have this collection of functions. And then he's kind of like moved this over to the domain of, of consciousness. So similarly, if a system performs these, uh, these functions, um, and he's used it in a positive and a negative way. So some functions would indicate an absence of consciousness and some functions would um, you know, lead to the presence of consciousness. And it's kind of like leading towards a uh, you know, Turing test for consciousness. <laughs> I mean, do, do you kind of support that? that so yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. In fact, you know, I was having dinner with, with, with Dave uh, after his talk and, and I actually brought this up because it wasn't clear from, 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 from his talk. And I said, look, this is the answer that I usually give to journalists when they asked me, you know, will machines ever be conscious and whatnot, and, and asked me if you and, and asked him if he agreed with it. And I actually expected him to disagree, but but I think again, don't want to put words in his mouth, but but that he agreed, right? Hmm. And and the answer is the following is that human beings, right, as we've discussed, have an amazing tendency to anthropomorphize things. It's reasoning by analogy. And what happens, I used to say this is what's going to happen at this point, is this is what is already happening, is that as soon as a machine behaves externally, even vaguely like its consciousness, we immediately start treating it as if it's consciousness. Mm. So if you look forward 10, 20, 50 years from now, we will just treat AIs as if they're consciousness and people won't even ask that question. They will assume AIs are conscious in the same way that we assume that each other, that we're conscious, right? And, and, but then, and so like from that pragmatic external point of view, maybe the question is answered, right? But you could be a philosopher or like sort of like a very, you know, a rigorous, you know, technical person. And they'll say like, no, 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 no. I really want to know if things, they may look, you know, conscious from the outside, but are they really, right? But that question, as far as I can tell, unfortunately, at the end of the day, is probably unanswerable. Now, there's a middle ground between these two things that maybe is where we'll wind up. And, and to me, sounds like probably the best thing that we're going to be able to do, which is that like, our understanding of the neural, informational, et cetera, correlates of consciousness evolves to a point where we have the feeling that we do understand consciousness. It's not just the lay person calls this consciousness even though, ha ha, it's mm -hmm. not like lambda is not conscious, you know, poor bozo, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, and, and, you know, there are many analogies to that in the history of science. There used to be a lot of things that, to, that were like magical, right? And we were like, oh, we're never going to understand, like life was magical, right? Life did not obey the laws of physics. It's just something else, right? This sounds laughable right now, but it wasn't laughable at all then, right? Yeah. And now, it's not like we've understood everything about life very far from it. When it's saying like, there's DNA and there's cells and, then, and this is how it all arises, right? And I think we're at the point in consciousness where it's still like, oh, consciousness is some so beyond us, right? I think we will get, you know, there will be a structure of DNA moment in the history of the study of consciousness. And I think, I think things like phi and this, you know, IT3 and whatnot, they very brave attempts to make progress in this direction. I think, you know, like Giulio Tononi in a way is, you know, very deluded in thinking that he has nailed what consciousness is, right? I think, you know, Phi maybe is, is an upper bound on consciousness, but with steps like this, hopefully at some point, and very much with the help of AI, right? 
AI is really useful for this because it's a, a brain that might be consciousness that we have a lot of control of. And you can do experiments that you can't, you know, with people, right? So I think we will make at least some progress in that direction for sure. Maybe to the point where we feel that, yes, we do understand what consciousness is. We're not asking ourselves that question anymore. And then we can point to things and say, this is consciousness, this is that kind of consciousness, that amount of consciousness, and so on. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I agree we're making a lot of progress in, in getting a handle on this. And although um, the, the biggest game in town is still the computationalism game, and as you say, historically, the only alternative was Mysterianism. And uh, my <laughs> right. friend, uh, Professor Mark Bishop, that he, he said that that's one of the reasons why he's become interested in the four E's in cognitive science, because for the first time, it's given him a, a kind of robust alternative to computationalism. But just coming back quickly, um, you know, he, as Chalmers referenced Thomas Nagel, you know, which is that um, it is something it is like to be a bat. Uh, yeah. What do you think about that? So, um, I'm not sure what your question is, but let me sh well, share. Well, what, what, what's your, I mean, do, do, you, do you agree that there is something it is like to be a bat? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. there is more, more and more than that, right? There is something that it's like to be a bat, mm -hmm. and it's very different from being a human, right? And we grossly underestimate, right? Again, we do this thing that, again, it's a heuristic, it works very well. It's like, we project ourselves into the bat because what else could we do, right? Yeah. But then what you see is a bat seen through the mind of a human, right? And in fact, there's this famous, I would say even more famous, uh, you, know, uh, you know, notion from, from Wittgenstein, right? That if the lion could talk, hmm. I would not understand anything that the lion was saying yeah. because his world is so different from mine. Now, I actually think, I think this is a, a very important position to, as a reference point, right? certainly a defensible one, and, you know, Wittgenstein was a good defender of it, but, but I actually think that this is going too far. Mm. I think, ultimately, I may never be able to completely know what it's like to be a lion, but we can make a lot, don't underestimate us either, right? We can make a lot of inroads into understanding what it's like to be a lion, uh, much more than we understand today. Same thing for a bat. And, you know, you could have also ask that for a fruit fly, right? In a way, a fruit fly is more different from us than a lion, but it's easier to understand, right? Because at some level, that thing is so simple that we can understand what's going on with it because it's not that deep. Yeah, that's a beautiful quote, actually. Um, so, so closing this off, do you think that large language models are slightly conscious or will be in the near future? I think, language, I think large language models are not slightly conscious by the reasonable, you know, everyday definition of the word slightly, meaning that their consciousness... So either, I think that either their consciousness is just zero, mm -hmm. right? If somebody asked me, like, you know, how much, you know, consciousness does, you know, Lambda have? Tell me in one word, and the answer would be zero, right? Mm. But another answer, which is hard to distinguish from the first one, is epsilon, right? Maybe it has a very tiny amount of consciousness, uh, but it's so tiny that it doesn't even qualify as slightly. Again, this gets back to what his architecture is. I, it, it actually gets to a lot of things, but for purposes of this discussion, right, Lambda and these large language models are not very different from a big lookup table. Mm. Any big lookup table is not conscious. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, there are a lot of interesting distinctions that you can make. Well, what if what I have is an efficient approximation to a lookup table? Isn't that what your brain is, right? And, and I would say yes. And, and, and then people say, well, but then why is your brain conscious but not the lookup table, right? And, and precisely the interesting question is that the consciousness comes about from the fact that you have to concentrate all of this information, you know, you know in real time into something, you know, very compact and that leads to action continuously, right? So mm -hmm. to put this in another way, maybe God is in consciousness because he doesn't need to be, right? If you're omnipotent and omniscient, you don't need to be conscious. You are effectively just a lookup table. Exactly. Right? And, yeah. and I, I, lo I loved your response earlier about the, the grain of sand and, and the oyster. I thought that was a beautiful way of looking at it. And, and ha having uh, recently studied so, I mean, personally, I, I, I think it's a lot to do with intentionality and agency, but I, I remember you responded to that. Um, just final quick, uh, final quick uh, fire question. What's your uh, definition of intelligence? So let me start with a technical definition, which is unfortunately not widely known enough and not appreciated enough, but mm -hmm. I think it's a really important one to have, right? Intelligence is solving NP-complete problems using heuristics. Mm. This is the real technical definition of AI, right? And there's a lot packed into that. Right? The fact that it's NP complete problems and the fact that it's using heuristics. If your problem is solvable with a lookup table with polynomial algorithms, you don't need intelligence and there's no intelligence there. It's when you start solving hard problems 
using heuristics mm -hmm. that you're getting into the realm of intelligence. Moreover, NP-complete is not the same as exponential, mm -hmm. right? The crucial thing about an NP-complete problem that connects very directly to our entire discussion of utility and whatnot is that the solution is easy to check. This is the key. Uh -huh. If you're working on problems whose solution is impossible to check effectively, I can't even tell if you're intelligent or not. The whole thing about intelligence in humans and machines is that how you solve the problem requires a lot of intelligence, a lot of computing power and whatnot, but then I can easily check the solution. But hang on, because that's a step away from behavior then, if you're saying the, the you know, like you have the, um, the percepts, the state and the action, and, and you're saying the state is also important. No, so to, to answer that head on, intelligence is not behavior, right? Intelligence, to, to, to give a slightly more general definition, and then there's several and they all have their yeah. merits, yeah. intelligence is the ability to solve hard problems. It, then more concretely, it's sending people complete problems and using heuristics, but like, for example, if you create an AI system that cures cancer, it doesn't behave in the sense that a human and a robot behave, hmm. but, but, you know, it's them intelligence, it's more intelligent than we are, right? It would be churlish to deny intelligence to that system, no matter how it solves cancer. If it finds a ridiculous simple, if it finds a ridiculously simple way to solve cancer, then it's even more brilliant, right? In fact, the simpler your outcome, the more intelligent you are, right? It yeah. takes intelligence to produce something simple. Wow. Concretely, in many circumstances, in particular evolution, right? Uh, intelligence manifests itself as behavior. There's a sequential mm -hmm. decision-making problem. There's an agent in the world that said, said, and so it's being a stochastic parrot. And I think also from, you know, theoretical reasons, by analyzing what a transformer can represent and how it can learn, my best guess, which could be wrong, again, I don't think anybody has the answer to this in this interesting question, is that those, tr let's, transformers, right, not LLMs, because LLM is more of like a, a task rather than the, you know, than the, the architecture. Transformers have a certain limited ability to do compositionality, very limited to compare to full logic programming, etc. Hmm. But exponentially better than something like an ordinary multilayer perceptron. Yeah. And if you just, I mean, even a multilayer perceptron or any learning algorithm is more than a stochastic parrot because it's general. The whole point of machine learning is to generalize beyond the data. Mm -hmm. If you generalize correctly beyond the data, you're not just a parrot anymore. And, you know, I, th I think it's not an accident that that term stochastic parrot came from Emily Bender, my linguistics colleague at UW, who does not understand machine learning. She's a classic linguist of the Chomsky variety who does, you know, does not fundamentally understand what I think, you know, she might disagree, what machine learning is all about. And she would probably look at any learning algorithm and say that it's a stochastic parrot, missing the fact that the whole point of machine learning and the thing that we focus on from, you know, beginning to end is generalizing. And as soon as you're generalizing correctly, even if you have no compositionality, you're, you're already doing something that's, that has a little bit of intelligence and that's beyond a stick, what a parrot would do. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, it's not, it's not a binary. And at the time, I thought they were stochastic parrots as well. I've, I've, I've updated my, my view. And you were talking as well about creativity. There's a kind of blurred hyperplane of creativity and we discussed you know, where that hyperplane um, sits. But you know, what's really interested me, I've, I've interviewed quite a few people that are um, working on, working on in-context learning uh, in these language models. And it seems like these language models are almost, almost like a new type of um, compiler. You know, you're writing a program inside the language prompt and they seem to work extremely well outside of the training range if you're doing like basic multiplication tasks. I, I think it is useful to look at them as a new type of compiler. And in fact, I've been saying for a long time that uh, you know, like there's there's this continuum from programming in assembly code to high level languages to doing AI, hmm. right? The point of AI is to continue along that path to making the language that computers speak ever closer to ours so that we can just program them by talking to them or writing things at them, right? Yeah. Having said that, I think that, you know, what goes on in the innards of a transformer, right, is actually still... Um, very primitive, for lack of a better word, right? There's a lot of, so something I tweeted that got a lot of follow-up from people like Jan and Gary and, and, and Huda Pearl, because they were all bringing in their own angle. So this was like, I said, and I think this is an interesting question, it's like, the interesting question about transformers is what needs to be added to them to get real intelligence. Mm -hmm. So we should not deny what they have, like the attention mechanism in particular, right? And the embeddings and the content, so like, there are two very important things in transformers that are beyond what was in neural networks 10 years ago mm -hmm. and, and, and are key. One of them is attention, 
Yeah. Right? Attention is a real advance. Mm -hmm. And the other one is context-specific embeddings. Mm -hmm. Right? Each of these ideas is important in its own right, and combining them together is very powerful. Right? Again, because the context-sensitive embeddings get that the similarity part of intelligence, the attention combined with the context sensitivity of the embeddings gets at the compositionality part. So, so they do have, so they are a couple of steps forward on the road to human level intelligence, but there are many more. And rather than, you know, either saying like, oh, they're just parrots, they don't do anything, or saying like, we've almost solved the AI, what we really should, we should try to understand better, you know, how, how the, you know, the attention and the context uh, dependent um, embeddings work, which we don't. But we also need to focus on like, now, what are we still missing? Because we definitely are, and that's really where most of our focus should be. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and also, just in defense of Bender, I mean, I, I think she, she's a brilliant linguist, and, and I personally think having that diversity of, of, of views from different people is, is useful. No, I mean, I, so uh, uh, I very much think that having a diversity of views is very important. And I think something that I'm always saying to my deep learning friends who can't stand, you know, who hate the guts of Gary Marcus is, we really, really need informed critics. Yeah. And very typically, your informed critics are not people in the field. We are experts, but then we also suffer from the distortion of being experts. Mm. It's people in, adjac in adjacent areas. And people like linguists and psychologists are very much those people. They're in adjacent areas enough to have a good critique of AI. So, for example, something that Jan is always throwing at, at, at Gary Marcus, that kind of... Uh, uh, doesn't sit well with me, says like, well, you should try building a real system sometime and you can't criticize us until we do. If we take the attitude that only engineers can criticize engineers, we're doomed. Right? Having said that, there is a very big distinction between the knowledgeable informed critics like Gary Marcus and the not so knowledgeable, not so well informed ones, of which unfortunately Emily is an example. I mean, I, she's my colleague at UW and I've talked with her about some of these things and her criticism of machine learning, unfortunately, like a lot of people, comes from a place of actually not fundamentally understanding it very well. But people do, people do say that Gary isn't an expert in deep learning and, and that he's you know, attention seeking. What would you say to that? No, he's, he's, he's not an expert in deep learning. And you know, so like, I agree with some of his criticisms. I disagree with, with others. Probably on balance, I disagree more with him than I agree. But mm. so first of all, there is a value to having critics like that, number one. But then number two, the reason his criticism, I mean, it would be bad if he was also an expert in deep learning and made the same criticisms. And then the problem is that often his criticisms are wrong because he has a mental model of deep learning that is already outdated or is oversimplified, yeah. right? Yeah. But that to some degree is unavoidable. But the thing that makes his criticism valuable is that he's doing it at a level where on a good day, on a bad day, his criticisms miss the mark, but on a good day, which is the ones that matter, his criticism is actually useful because it's at a level where you don't need to understand the details. It's like, you claim to be producing intelligence. Mm -hmm. I, as a psychologist, know a lot about intelligence. That's what I study for a living, right? Yeah. He knows more about aspects of intelligence than I do. Yeah. And, and, and from that point of view, what you're doing is lacking. And, and, and that, I mean, like, he's written whole books about, you know, again, because this goes back to when he was a PhD student and, you know, and symbolic learning and whatnot. There are very, uh, you know... Uh, the, the, the deep learning folks have repeatedly underestimated how well he understands some of these problems because mm. as a psychologist in particular interested in language learning, he's actually thought very long and hard about them. Oh, I know. So I've, I've read his, his book and it, I mean, we've had him on the show three times. So Which yeah. book? Um, the Al Algebraic Mind. Yeah, so that's and, you the know, most like, relevant one here. Yeah, yeah. And as a psychologist, you know, yeah. I mean, he spent a lot of time studying how children learn rules. Right. And he, he talks very elegantly about a compositionality. And we've spoken about this. It's irrefutable. And I agree with him and we've supported him. I, I, I guess um, so, so some of the things he argues are based on ethics, politics and virtue. And, and some of the things like compositionality, I, I think, are irrefutable. I mean, I think irrefutable is a very strong word. I wouldn't say that they're irrefutable. I would okay. say that they have, they have very strong backing, which the connectionists have not been able to effectively refute. Hmm. But some of the criticisms that they have, you know, meaning people like Pinker and Prince and whatnot, famously of connectionists in the 80s, some of them are still valid, which is very salient, but some of them not really. And again, hmm. To go back to the daddy of this whole school of thought, who's Chomsky, right? His, you know, he made his name basically panning things like, you know, Markov models of language, mm. n-gram models, which you could say large language models are just a very glorified version of, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But and at the time you could that criticism was very apt and and you know and, and timely and it was useful, right? But 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 and in famous is like is like you can't learn a context free grammar, but context free grammar is what you do. Well actually now we know formally that you can learn a context free grammar mm-hmm. and, and you know because you only have to learn it probabilistically, which is what we do and what our systems do. So his criticism was just, you know, mathematically off the mark, but also when you look at systems that do speech, language, et cetera, et cetera, it is that statistical approach that he made his name panning that has prevailed. Yeah. And for reasons that we understand very well, and large language models are just the latest, greatest expression of that. So at that level, a whole Chomsky and Pinker, Gary Marcus view of things, not only is it not irrefutable, it has been refuted. Hmm. Okay. Let, let's just quickly come back to your definition of intelligence. So um, solving NP hard problems. I assume you would zoom out a little bit and, you know, it's more of a meta-learning algorithm, so the ability to, sol- to solve different problems. Yes, so it's, if, very good point. If all you have is the ability to solve one NP-complete problem, that does not qualify as general intelligence, right? Yeah. There's, there's like, these days this is a common definition to make this different difference between uh, you know, narrow intelligence and, and general intelligence and AGI and whatnot, right? And if you only solve one NP compute problem very well, you have narrow intelligence is the way I would put it, but you do not have general intelligence. General intelligence is precisely the ability to solve a, a limitless variety of problems, all that have this characteristic of they're hard to solve, but the solution is easy to check, hmm. right? Hmm. I mean, if you have the ability to solve problems whose solution isn't easy to check, then maybe you're intelligent, but I can't decide whether you're intelligent or not. Interesting. Okay, and um, actually, um, Gary did, uh, he put a paper out about 20 years ago talking about how neural networks can't extrapolate. I think it was when he encoded numbers with a, with a binary encoding or, or whatever. And um, we've been on a bit of a journey on, on this. So we had Randall Bellastriero, I've, I've interviewed him yesterday. He's got this paper called The Spline Theory of Neural Networks. It basically says that a neural network uh, decomposes an input space into these input-activated polyhedra. And when we first read that, we felt that it, it kind of... Um, indicated Francois Cholet's assertion that neural networks are locality sensitive hashing tables and they only generalize within uh, you know these tiny polyhedra and Randall's now updated this view to say in contrast to decision trees these hyperplanes they actually um, inform a lot of information in the extrapolative regime outside of the training range so um, I always thought it was the inductive priors that gave the extrapolative performance on, on neural networks by photocopying the information everywhere and um, so, like, you know, this is a great example of where, you know, Gary might update his views because even basic MLPs are far more extrapolative than anyone realized. This is a very interesting question, but the way I would put it is that in that regard, in some sense, both of the sides are right. Hmm. And the reason they're both right is that we're in very high dimensional spaces. Yeah. And we're in a very high dimensional space, the following thing can happen, which is, you know, you have a data point and you generalize to a vast region around that data point. And it's unfair to characterize these things as saying they just interpolate. In some sense, they really do extrapolate. But at the same time, that vast region that they generalize correctly to is an infinitesimal fraction of the much, much vaster region that they have not generalized to, but you and I can. Hmm. So, so you've got to keep that distinction in mind. And then in particular, right, um, I like to say that deep learning is nearest neighbor in curved space. And both parts of that are very important, right? So, you know, Jan uh, uh, LeCun was, was, was famous, um, you know, during the glory days of kernel machines for saying that kernel machines are just glorified template matches, right? And of course, that didn't earn him any friends, but he was right. They really are just glorified template matches. Kernel machine is really a souped up, more mathematically elegant and blah, blah, blah version of nearest neighbor, mm-hmm. right? And the nearest neighbor is just a template matcher. The beauty in the power of nearest neighbor, though, is that there is a neighborhood within, within which often it generalizes very well, right? Now, I think what Jan was missing, and I probably still is, is that convnets and deep learning, they are still just a glor- they are also glorified nearest neighbor, except more glorified. And the way in which they're more glorified, which is very important, is that they are doing nearest neighbor in curved space. They are still just doing, you know, generalization by similarity, which you could argue is all that machine learning does is generalizing by similarity. And now the notion of similarity can vary, right? But the important thing that they've done is that nearest neighbor just uses some distance measure in the original space, whereas the neural networks are warping the space 
to make the problem easier for the nearest neighbor, you know, essentially dot product based similarity uh, 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 computation that they're actually doing. Sure, but but you're you're very much arguing um, this is the way Francois Cholet puts it that you know you have all of these um, uh, transformations and and you kind of um, distort the space you know to represent the data manifold and you know you want it to you you, you stop SGD at the right time so that you, you approximate the data manifold and you can do this kind of latent space um, you know interpolation on the geodesic of that mm -hmm. manifold. But you know R Randall's idea is is completely away from that idea of of, of you know these models learning this curved space and. So if you do slice the space up with these hyperplanes, rather than it being a locality prior, which is what you're talking about, these hyperplanes give you globally relevant information to things that are you know, miles away from the training data. Yeah, so, but uh, these two perspectives are, are, are more similar than you might think. Because right. I can take a distorted version of space and decompose it into polyhedra. Yep. Right? And one or the other might approximate what's really going on better. I mean, these neural networks do form curved spaces, except that in practice they're not curved because they're finite. But, it, but ignoring that, right? When, let, let me put it this way. An eloquent example of this is, if you look back at the original space, right? Again, treat the, this thing as a black box. Where does it generalize to? Does it generalize only to things, neural networks as we have them today, does it generalize correctly only to things that are locally near the data point or it can generalize well to things that are far, right? Mm. And the thing is that with nearest neighbor, you by you know almost intrinsically, you only generalize period at all to things that are local. The beauty of, of deep learning and of the space warping that's going on is again, going back to this notion of the path kernel is that you're actually doing a nearest neighbor computation, not just in a space that's warped, but you're doing it in the space of gradients, which actually means that you can generalize correctly to things that are very far Hmm. from your examples, except they look similar in gradient space. A very simple example of this is a sine wave, right? Yeah. If I try to learn a sine wave using nearest neighbor, I need an infinite number of examples, right? Because, you know, like, what I've learned over here helps me not at all with the next turn of the sine wave. Like, that continuous extrapolation, right? At some hmm. point, there's this disaster where if the last piece of the sine was going up, I just keep going up and getting more and more wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this kind of thing does happen in neural networks, but they also have the part to say like, and this again, this also happens, which is I'm going to transform this space more into a more intelligent one, which is the space of the slopes. Mm -hmm. Right. And now if I've seen one cycle of the sine wave with some density of examples, by similarity in that transformed space, I generalize correctly and trivially to every other turn of the sine wave. So there's a very big fundamental difference between the two. Interesting. And you think with an MLP, it would be possible to have that kind of extrapolative generalization on a sine wave? Well, so people have studied this in, in, in multiple ways. And the problem, so the question is, it depends on what are the um, uh, um, basis functions that it's using. Yes. So something that we didn't allude to at all in this conversation, but underlies all of this is like, what is your choice of basis functions, right? Yeah. And the thing is, an MLP with the traditional, say, sigma or ALU basis mm -hmm. functions will not learn this no matter, for obvious reasons, right? Yeah. And again, you can represent it, right? The representative theorem is there. Like, you know, like, the sine wave is just one sigmoid and then another one, you know, with a minus sign and then another one, but the data doesn't let you learn it. Yes. Right? If as a basis function you have sine waves, which is nothing unimaginable, that's what a Fourier transform is then, then you can learn it so easily it's not even funny. Mm -hmm. So it depends mm -hmm. dramatically on, on, on the basis function. And the question really becomes, what are the basis functions and the, and the architecture that let me generalize correctly to a lot of things, including this, such that, for example, and this is a very simple test, is like, I can nail a sine wave with a small number of examples without it being one of my basis functions. Yeah, exactly. And then this, this all comes back to, you know, we're talking about inductive priors and the bias variance trade-off and, and even symmetries, actually. I mean, uh, Taco Cohen once said that, um, you know, if, if you encode all of the um, the symmetries into the label function, then you would only need one uh, labeled example. So it's always a trade-off between how much induction are you doing. Well, uh, interesting you should say that. I understand why he says that, and it's uh, and it's not technically wrong, but I would say that practically what you need is a, is, is a, such a set of symmetries per region of the space, mm. right? Per mm. cluster, right? Mm. But, 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 you know, in another way, I would actually make an even stronger statement, which again is very, uh, very perfectly mathematical. Sounds same, which is 
an object is just the sum of its symmetries mm. or a function. If you tell me all the symmetries, every last one of an object, you've defined the object. So if I can learn the symmetries at that level, I don't need anything else. Of course, as we already discussed, that's not the whole answer. Likewise, with any function, if you tell me all the properties of the function, there, there are, there, you know, and to be more precise, all the symmetries of a function, at some point you've told me the whole function. And vice versa, from the function, I, I can, you know, I can read out all the symmetries that it has in principle. Doing that in practice can be, you know, a very difficult and subtle thing to do. That's a beautiful thing to say. You give me the symmetries and I'll give you the object. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. Yeah. Professor yeah. Pedro Domingos, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an honor. Thanks for having me. Amazing.